I've always had some kind of affinity with the paranormal. When I was a teenager, I wouldn't stop writing extremely dark, creepy poetry. I have always been a loner. One best friend kind of people, if none. Anyway, on to the story. My parents divorced when I was young, so I became depressed and spent a lot of time alone. We moved in with my grandpa and grandma, and they gave us a little house near them. It was so close that we didn't have to walk five meters to reach the other door. My mom always spent time there with them, when I preferred to be alone in our new little house. One time, I was sleeping in the dark there. I dreamed that there was a guy with a black face, sitting at the edge of my bed, staring at me. I awoke terrified, with that dreadful feeling that there was someone there with me. I snapped out of my place, turned on the lights, and ran to my grandpa's house, and sat beside my grandma and said, that house can be so creepy. She said, of course. Two guys died there from gas while they were renting the place. We found them a week later. She said it like it was a casual thing to tell, and it was also a slap on the face. That was only a warm up though. As I got older, my mum remarried, and my grandpa moved to another house of his, 150 meters from the previous one. I was left to rot in the old one, living alone for an entire year and a half in my grandpa's old house, which was big, old and creepy, even though their new house wasn't too far from me. But still, I saw stuff there, shadow people. I remember avoiding most areas in the house. My living consisted in staying in the living room, kitchen and bathroom. The reason was, I always got that eerie feeling of being watched all the time. I was a student finishing my graduation project, so I didn't leave the house that much, except for buying my groceries. There were two long hallways in my house. The first led to the bathroom, and the second left to my previous grandparents' room. It was a big room, and it was always locked as they kept their stuff in there. So when you stood in the hallway, you couldn't see the door at the end of it. It was so dark, like an endless hallway of darkness. I always avoided that area. You'd somehow start to feel when something is wrong in these situations. I would always hear banging on the door very late at night, at 2 or 3 a.m. I would brush it off and play courageous since I had no choice. I had to stay in that house or else I had literally nowhere to live. I was always locking the door to the living room, turning the TV on and trying to fall asleep every night. The door didn't lock all that well and I'd use a chair as an added measure. One night I wasn't feeling so good and woke up burning with a fever, almost hallucinating, when I heard the chair move. That's when I saw them. A small, dark, shadowy figure sneaking a peek on me. I couldn't believe my eyes. I got up, switched the light on and looked. The chair moved out of its place to let the door slightly open. I started crying. I called my parents, but none of them answered. To be fair, it was around three in the morning. I prayed and tried calming down, convincing myself that I was imagining it. Two months later, I was watching a video about the jinn on YouTube with loudspeakers. For those of you who don't know, jinn are creatures in the Islamic religion equivalent to demons. The video was called 30 Facts You Didn't Know About Jinns. The last one stated that jinns were living with us, and one of them could probably be watching you right now. I giggled and said, I'm not scared. 
but I knew I would regret that later. That same night, I put some Quran readings, since it was supposed to keep the shadow people and jinns away, as per my religion. And I kid you not, at 2am I woke up to three shadow people dancing. One of them was at my feet, another at my head, and the third standing at my face. They were all making a strange noise, almost like static. It was so annoying. I screamed, telling them to leave me alone. And they left, and all was calm. Soon after, I began suffering from insomnia. I couldn't sleep at night anymore. I would spend the night studying, finishing my project, cooking, watching TV, playing video games, and drifting at around 6am when daylight began peaking. Once, I went to sleep and began dreaming. It was so realistic, it didn't even feel like a dream. And I started hearing some kind of whispers. It's not gentle whispering. It was violent, like a chorus from hell. The closest description would be the soundtrack from Dante's Inferno. Quiet, but loud and evil and aggressive. I would hear it in my ears always at the same time. But it was always different. I was still dreaming. I stood up for the source of the sound, and it was at the creepy room at the end of the hallway, which probably became haunted, because it wasn't open for too long. I got closer, and there was a man emerging from the darkness. He was bold, short, and had muscular arms. I could even see his veins. He looked right through my soul while he came my way, and I started reciting prayer. At the same time, I heard my cousin screaming at the stairs of the house on my left, telling me to flee. The door was opposite to my left, so I started moving, and it was a struggle, like something was pulling me from the other way. I made it through the open door, and got out gasping for air. I thought this thing was chasing me. It's in my house, and I didn't want to go back. That's when I woke up, to the whispering in my ear once more. After a while, my grandparents came to stay for a bit. She would always sleep with the light on at night. I woke up feeling strange, and I kid you not, there was a giant little girl holding something in her left arm. She had the wildest eyes I'd ever seen whilst grinning at me. She was staring right through me and holding a little dwarf kind of guy. He had a tail and greyish skin, and was staring at my grandma. I didn't know what to do, so just tried to go back to sleep and ignored them. On another occasion, I was sleeping, and actually conversing with someone or something. I thought I was dreaming, but when I opened my eyes, I couldn't see them. But was still arguing with them. You should let us in. You're done for anyways. Nobody wants you. Your parents left. We're the only ones that will help you now. I was afraid of them. I didn't trust them. What were they saying? They were pressuring me. I was feeling lost, desperate and alone. I opened my eyes and was crying and a mess. One other night, I dreamed that I was in a very big bedroom in a castle, and it was very fancy. The bedroom was very well decorated, and there was an old woman who looked like a cliché witch attending a funeral. She was asking me to let her in. She was very angry, and after a while of making fun of her, she left. And then another one came. This one took her place and was deaf and mute. It was a very strange dream. And after that, my grandma started sleeping in her old bedroom, and accused me of running around her bed, throwing stuff at her in the middle of the night, pulling the covers off and the like. I didn't know what she was talking about, but she once woke up screaming, and we found half of her stuff burned beside her candles. No lighters, no fire source, and she left that same night. Fast forward a while, 
I grew up, graduated, started working and got a job out of the country. I left my current work in the Middle East and I stay alone in a room in a local housing and I wake up at 5 a.m. to find white fog in my face. I was covered in it. I stay there for a while, then it turned completely black and vanished. I have no idea what it was. In 1996, when my mum was six months pregnant with me, she decided that she wanted to play the Ouija board with her sister. My grandmother died about three months beforehand, and they wanted to see if they could contact her. My mum and aunt say that they had talked to what they thought was their mother, who tragically died in that house three months prior. They spoke for about 30 minutes until the planchette made a sharp movement and the air went ice cold. The planchette was moving very fast on the board as it kept repeating, mine, mine, mine. This really scared my mum, so they stopped the session. A few weeks later, my mum goes into labour. At the time, this scared my mum because I was a month and a few weeks early. When I was born, I was so small that I had to stay in the hospital for two more weeks. All was well when my mum and I left. Fast forward to when I was four, I started getting horrible night terrors of me sitting on the top of the stairs in my house. In the dream, you could tell that it was daytime, but it was still dark. My feet were stuck to the floor like it was quicksand, and I would scream and scream for what felt like hours, and at the end of the dream I would always be able to see something crawling up me slowly. It was very skinny, long-limbed, this black creature with extremely long fingers and darker fingernails that were even longer. His eyes were a big, burning red. I would get this dream so often that when this creature would start to appear, I would be able to wake myself up. These dreams were quite an often occurrence, almost every night. I told my mum about it, and she told me that I shouldn't stay up late and scare myself with stories. My mum's attitude definitely started to change when my little sister started saying creepy things. At this time, my sister was two and a half years old, and very smart. One night, my sister and I were in my room getting tucked in at the end of the night, and every night my sister and mum played a little game before bed. My mum would tell my sister to spell a word, and my sister would spell it, and she would get a prize. As my mum said goodnight to us, my sister says, Mummy, can you spell black man? Better run. She said this in the most sing-song horror movie kind of way. That night I woke up to something very odd. An old lady at the end of my bed. Honestly, she looked so real, I thought a real old lady was in my room. I screamed, turned on the light and she wasn't there. Totally creeped out. I remember keeping the light on as I couldn't sleep in the dark anymore. It was too paralyzing. All of a sudden, I wake up in the darkness again. I didn't even remember closing my eyes to sleep. And there was that old woman at the edge of the bed. This time I knew she wasn't human. She had blue skin, rotting teeth. Her eyes were an unnatural blue and she was just staring at me smiling. Then she began to laugh. It started with a small giggle and then she started cackling. She laughed so hard that she threw her head back, acting like a mental patient. I was in such shock I couldn't even cry. My mouth was agape. And after a while, she was laughing so much her mouth was getting larger. It unhinged like that of a snake. And then suddenly, mid-laugh, she stops, snaps her head back, and in a very fast and low man's voice says, If you're scared, cover your head, little piggy because I'm not gonna stop. I did that right away. I covered my face in my blankets, and right away she began laughing again. I laid there for what felt like hours under my blanket, scared to death. Finally, I awoke. Daylight. Now after this happened, I told my mum, and she called my grandpa, who was a pastor. He came over, blessed the house, and everything was okay for the most part. One thing happened after a while when I was a teenager. And after I got older, I moved downstairs and got my own bedroom. 
and my sister stayed upstairs. Every night without a doubt, I would always wake up at 4.30am. I would hear creaking down my stairs, footsteps, and I would hear these footsteps all the way to my door to my room. Then my door would slowly open. No one would ever be there. And after a minute or two, it would slowly close. After my entire childhood of living there, we finally moved. I was 17 and had not noticed anything creepy besides the door in years. One night, my mum's sister and I were all on her bed watching TV. It was June, and that day we had horrible thunderstorms. The storms got so bad that the power went out, and we all decided to go to sleep because it was getting late anyway. Then all three of us wake up at the exact same time. It's still dark, and it's very cold considering the fact that it was summer and the AC was off. Then all three of us gasp as we see at least a seven foot tall figure right in the bedroom doorway. Suddenly, I hear that laugh that I'd heard so many years ago. I knew who it was. Then the creature whispers something to us, something that is burnt into my memory. I found you. My entire body was in shock. He found us, the black man. Then he vanished, like he was never there. Nothing happened after that for years. That is until I moved to Florida with my then boyfriend, now husband. My husband worked third shift, so I always found myself not being able to sleep at night. I went out one night around 1am to smoke a joint. I have a very small house with a small front yard. I was planning on smoking fast and running inside. As I finished my joint and started walking, I noticed a long black arm with black claws stretching down from the roof, like something was going to grab my hair. It was inhuman. I told my husband, and he responded that he was worried about my health. That is, until he saw the black thing on top of the roof. That was the other day. Can anyone tell me why he's on my roof? I'm just wondering when he's going to try and come inside. I come from a military family, and as such, I lived all over the country, often unable to keep friends for any period. I also have insane social anxiety, so I'm overall pretty bad at making friends to begin with. This story starts after I lived in rural Newfoundland for about three years, at age 14. I have no friends. My home life is pretty terrible, and I was at this point pretty depressed. I lived on about an acre of land, with a river separating us from about a million acres of raw forest that had a bunch of ATV trails in it. It was a spooky forest, and I have tons of stories about what I saw in there that makes most horror movies look like a joke. Of note is the Bear Trap Forest, the 40-foot swamp, the random abandoned suburb, and the house in the middle of nowhere. But these are tales for another time. It was around late August. My parents had told me for many weeks now, there had been hoots and hollers coming from our backyard. They had seen flashlights and thought it was just some kids trying to break into our garage and steal some beer. There had been times, and I'd heard it too, normally in the evening, of just a couple of voices periodically hollering and often I heard several voices speaking from just across the river in the woods. No big deal. A lot of kids hung out in those woods, and due to my oppressive social anxiety, I sure as hell didn't have any desire to talk to them. After this happened for some weeks, I heard the kids doing their usual thing around four in the afternoon, and decided, you know what? I'm going to see what's so amusing. So I ventured into the woods, and go maybe about 300 feet, and an ATV trail my neighbour used. 
and I met one of them. I'm going to use their names, as it will give some context. The kid I met was called Jack. He was a year or two younger than me, about a foot shorter and wearing some really out of date clothes. He seemed kind of surprised to meet me, but we said our hellos. I said I had heard them for a while now, and came to see what was happening. Jack got super pumped, and insisted I follow him to his friend's project. So I followed the guy, and I'm taken into an area that is pretty clear cut, in a dense path of woods. I knew this area. I hung out in the woods alone a lot, and explored, and this was brand new. There were two other kids there, one my age named Elvis, and another older kid by about two years called Louie. They said they were working on a treehouse slash fort, and wondered if I would be interested in helping. I of course said yes, I had never been asked to hang out with anyone, and they showed me around. Now, I need to discuss these kids' clothes. When I say out of style, I'm talking early 80s miserable fashion. Neon colors, one kid had shoulder pads, and was a mess. They wore big rubber boots, and the kids looked, I want to say, new like they had no signs of pimples, their hair was immaculate, their clothes crisp as hell. I had just assumed they were hand-me-downs from their parents or something, as they stated that they were all friends, not brothers. So these kids were nice to me, and I mean really nice. I never really got to know them, they never wanted to talk about their home life, but that isn't surprising where I lived. We used hatchets, saws, ropes, and nails to make a pretty solid fort. Had about eight foot walls made of birch trees, and we made a table to sit at. A lookout post in the biggest tree that we could find. The place was about the size of a one bedroom apartment, and we were all pretty proud. One day, we were sitting at the table, talking about our favorite trees or something, and I asked Elvis why I'd never seen him around before. If he lived near me, he had to go to my school. It was one of two schools in the town, and no way he lived in the catchment area of the other one. He insisted he did, and wondered why he'd never met me either. We didn't know the same classmates, same people, and could barely agree on teachers. But whatever. These kids talked to me, and that was enough. So about two weeks after meeting them and building this fort, on one of these days, I said I needed to go home and get something to eat. I asked if they wanted something too, as this was basically my backyard and my parents always made way too much food. They became downright hostile. Not over the food, they just refused to cross the river, adamantly. Louis came up with the story about how crossing a stranger's river is bad luck, but I sure wasn't pushing the issue. I asked if they wanted something, and they said yes, and I brought back a pie that we could all eat. They apologized about getting angry, said they were just very superstitious, and I thought nothing more of it. We had a good rest of the day planning to invade the woods looking for some thick pine trees. Cut to about a week later. I had went to the fort and we did our thing, but today the kids looked haggard. Jack was particularly bad. He looked like he had just gotten the beat down of his life while catching pneumonia three times over. I asked if he was okay. He said he just had flu. But they also looked wet, maybe greasy is a better word. They had sick hair. Their skin was all shiny and clammy, and their clothes looked like ass. I wasn't shocked. These kids wore the same clothes pretty much every day, but so did a lot of the really poor kids in town. 
We played around for an hour or so before they left, with Louis saying he would see me tomorrow, as Jack and Elvis walked away coughing like they'd smoked a pack a day. I had told my parents about these kids. They thought they were weird, but a kid with no friend just found three, so don't ask questions. The nighttime hollering had stopped at this point, and we never did see the flashlights again. So the next day I went back with a hatchet, a bag of nails in hand, as the plan was that we were gonna give the lookout a roof. When I come to the fort, the place is wrecked. The walls had been torn down. The table was in half, and the lookout had maybe one or two pieces left to it. Most notably, everything was rotting, like it had been sitting there for decades, rotting. The table was basically nothing, and I could see growth in what had been our floor. Solid, half-tree growth. My only thought was, what the hell? And I rationalized that maybe someone found out about the fort and wrecked it. So I waited for the kids to come. Next day, and the next day, and the day after that. I waited a week, but never did see those kids again. I was pretty dejected, and eventually I stopped trying to wait for them. I wanted to look for them, but they had never shown me or told me where they lived, other than up the hill. My parents noticed and asked me why I wasn't hanging out with the kids anymore. I told them what was happening and they dismissed it and just insisted that they probably didn't want to be my friend, that I didn't need them. I was sad for a good while after that. Cut to today, I'm 29, and telling my wife about these kids I used to hang out with. And this time, we made a call forward. I explain how they look, how they acted, and it's overall a pretty good memory with a sad ending. My wife looks at me wide-eyed and said, You hang out with a bunch of spooky ghost kids. I find this crazy. But she says, Did anyone else see them? And no, they didn't. They saw a flashlight, but not the kids. They heard them, and they heard about them. But no one had ever laid an eye on them other than me. There were never any records I could find about them. No one else in the school they supposedly went to knew them, and they never showed me their house or came to mind despite my insistence. My wife said it was some spooky stuff, and that I should probably share it with all of you. What do you guys think? I've experienced several things throughout my 36 years that could be unexplained supernatural occurrences. When I was a kid in particular, I had some recurring harassment that would make me afraid to be in my room. Enough so, that my mother purchased me one of those little red bed tents that us kids in the 80s liked so well. I ran into some odd situations while at sea in the Navy too. Anyway, I had essentially forgotten about most of my previous experiences I had, because I became somewhat of a close-minded skeptic. Even weird things that cropped up as an adult, I noted were odd and that I couldn't explain, but I would dismiss them as just being personally unaware of the science behind whatever it was that I'd be witnessing. Three years and maybe some change ago, the VA accidentally declared me dead, which had just been one in a series of negative events in my life that had started a sort of decline in my expectations for what the future could hold. During that time, a buddy of mine who was like a brother that I had known since I was six moved in with me. As his life was also spiraling downwards, together one night, we decided to watch a bunch of YouTube videos on how to summon demons and trade things for a better future. I also had two girls related to an ex-girlfriend of mine 
who needed to escape their abusive family living with me in my finished basement. The basement had no entry from the house. You have to leave the house just to access it. So it was like their own little apartment. And a good deal for a 21 year old and 18 year old, considering how I let them stay rent free, as long as they helped with my sons, helped with cleaning, and cooked two meals a week. They come into this later. For now, they were just the ones that had suggested to my buddy and myself that we should look for videos about bargaining with the supernatural. The videos weren't particularly helpful, but we decided to start easy and went with the poor man's Ouija, the game called Charlie. I'm sure everyone is aware of what it is, but just in case you're not, you place a pencil on a piece of paper split it into four squares with yes and no written in opposite corners. One pencil sits in the center, and the other pencil is balanced on top of it. Then you say things like, Charlie, is X true? And then the top pencil is supposed to spin gently towards the yes or no answer. We did this a few times, and we had enough success that my buddy actually posted a video of the pencil turning on its own to his Facebook account. Invigorated by our success, and the potential to gain loot from whatever we made a deal, we smoked a bunch of super dank reefer and came up with what could essentially be our trade template. We were operating under the assumption that everyone who traded their soul to the devil had done such in a rush to be famous or rich that they didn't care about their part of the trade, or how unbalanced it might be for them. We came up with a 30 for 30 trade. You see, I was around 33 when we decided on this, and figured 30 years really wasn't that bad to live as a soul enslaved to a malevolent entity, for a trade of 30 years alive as a successful human. That bargain in mind, I bothered my cat until it scratched me enough for me to bleed, and I pressed my thumb into the cut, and then onto the Charlie paper. This, I believe, was the catalyst for the rest of the weird stuff that had continued to this day. My buddy refused to put his own blood on the paper. He was raised Christian, and steadily became less involved, and more just a witness as I pushed forward. I don't remember verbatim what I said, but essentially I laid out my deal, my expectations and my offering. I offered up 30 years of service to whatever after my death, for 30 years of wealth and influence. I didn't want fame, fame seemed like more work than it's worth. I just wanted to have enough loot to make sure my two sons, who live with me 100% of the time, were taken care of forever and that I could live out the rest of my days feeling successful because I had loot, regardless of how I got to obtaining it. The pencil didn't spin. The lights did not flicker. There was no sudden cold breeze. My buddy and I did have a simultaneous sensation of being watched, however. We both turned around to see if the girls had come into the house, or if one of my sons had woken up. Nothing. We were alone. My buddy slept on one of the sofas, and I fell asleep on my recliner sofa in front of my coffee table, where the bloody Charlie game was at rest. I slept easy, even though I felt a bit uneasy, as if someone was staring at me as I urinated. That's kinda how I felt, but nonetheless slept. When I awoke, I followed my usual routine, I didn't even consider the night before until I grabbed my coffee cup. My buddy was still asleep. I typically wake up earlier than anyone else in the house, and I sat down in the same spot I had slept. And as I went to place my coffee down, I noticed an odd handprint on my coffee table facing me. The fingertips were pointed towards where I had slept. I actually took a picture of it because it was so strange. It was smaller than my handprint. The fingers were thinner, and there were only four digits, three thumbs and a finger. The weird part was, the nails seemed to have left an impression on the table too, as there were pointed claw-looking impressions. 
When I say impressions, I don't mean the wooden table was scarred. What I mean is its dark surface, and it looked like someone had placed a hot, sweaty, oddly shaped hand there, not long enough to leave a smudgy white imprint. That's why the claw impression just being there seemed odd. That, and only one hand impression was there. Not two, just the one four digit hand. I put my hand next to it. My hands were much too big. My buddy's hands were too big. And my youngest hands were too small. My oldest son's hands were too small. The girls came up from the basement and before they told me about their night, I interrupted them and had them put their hand next to the impression on the table. Both hands were too small. Then they told me that I had kept them up all night. They thought my buddy and I had gotten drunk and were jamming out to 90s rock and metal. Truth be told, that's a legitimate assumption. We do that. But the night prior, we hadn't. In fact, we hadn't had a single drink, and we had turned off the videos after we came across the Charlie game. The only noise had been us talking excitedly at some points. The girls, however, said that there was a bunch of loud thumping and constant heavy music. In their words, but they consider corn heavy music. The 18 year old swore she thought that we had legitimately had a party going on with even more of our friends. My sons, however, heard nothing. It was weird, but we all sort of dismissed it as odd and noteworthy, but nothing more. That night, my buddy and I looked at some more videos about demons and bargaining with them. We watched a video that claimed that just by watching you, you were participating in a demonic summoning. As the night went on, things around the house seemed more uneasy. My buddy and I were both feeling unnerved, and every noise the house made seemed unnatural. Eventually, we turned on Aqua Teen Hunger Force and passed out. The same places as the night before. The following morning, the coffee table that I had since wiped down, erasing the previous prints, now had two of the same impressions on it, both facing me as the ones from the previous morning. The only noticeable difference is that there were two prints, and that the thumbs were again in the same place as the human thumbs. However, once again, only four digits and odd claws pointed towards where I had slept. My eldest son immediately became worried and claimed that I was being haunted by the rake from the famous creepypasta. I confessed, creepypastas are whack to me, so I wasn't familiar with this story at the time, and I took time to watch a few versions explaining it. I wasn't impressed, and it didn't resonate with me as a sensible answer to what I had been witnessing. Only the claws and the insinuation that something had been watching me fit. The girls claimed to have another rough night this time. However, it wasn't noises upstairs. It was the lights in the basement turning on and off, and the sound of something scratching at their door, and one door that leads outside in the woods at the edge of my property. We live in the woods, on a mountain, with a few acres of land, so the idea of something scratching on the door isn't too far from likely. I've even had bears roam my land, so something scratching at the door is certainly not unheard of around here. The girls continued having nights of being freaked out. Despite that, after the third morning of handprints, I had stopped being involved with any odd event. The girls grew so frightened they moved upstairs and slept on the other two sofas. So now the four adults in the house slept in the living room, while my son slept in their own rooms. I have my own bedroom, but I just don't like sleeping in beds. The girls continued to have odd experiences in the bathroom, feeling like they were being watched. The shower curtain being pulled back when no one was in the room. My sons both woke up with what appeared to be cat scratches on their chest one morning. They seemed superficial enough, but they were spooked, because my cats will suffer anything except me using them to dust tables. That's how I got them to scratch me for the original game of Charlie. One night, all four of us heard the scratching at the door, this time on the upstairs door, and not the basement. 
As a combat vet, I have firearms, so my buddy and I step outside and search the immediate area. We kept hearing rustling, so we followed it around the edge of the property, until we got down by the basement. We both noticed the light was on, but my buddy was the first to notice movement through the windows. In order to prevent air leaks, the few windows the basement has are covered with weatherproof plastic, so we could only make out the shadow of a head moving back and forth. Whoever it was, certainly didn't belong in my basement, and especially not at night time. We came around the door, which was already opened, and yelled into the basement that we were armed, and that by coming forward now, they would be safely escorted from the property, whereas jumping out could lead to being injured. But there was no response. No sound, but all the lights were on, and the door had been wide open. The majority of my basement is open space, with just one finished room, save a missing door. The older girl had stayed there, and she had hung a blanket in place of a door. My buddy was standing behind me, and when I moved the blanket hanging in the door, all the lights in the basement shut off. A totally audible snap too. My buddy called out, What is it? and ran outside, and I followed him out behind his movements later. He was genuinely spooked when I came out, and told me he had run out because he was certain I had pushed past him in the dark, and ran out ahead of him. So, when he said, what is it? He thought he was talking to me running past him, despite the fact I hadn't moved until he left the basement. I closed the door and put a cement block in front of it. We went back upstairs, put the rifles away, and described what happened. Upstairs, the power had gone out too, but when the girls had gone to the breaker box, which is upstairs in a broom closet by some weird 70s design, the power came back on without an issue. Perhaps to the basement as well, though I'm unsure whether we noticed it did or not. The girls moved out. They still keep in touch and visit, but won't stay overnight because they're afraid of whatever I did. They definitely think I lost something when I tried to make a deal. I've repeatedly pointed out to them that I've received no such bounty as stated in the deal I offered and they pointed out that just a couple of months after the Charlie game, the VA finally fixed their mistake about my status and began paying me again. They also noted that soon after the game, my writing had been noticed, and I have been making money with that, and gained a smallish following. They also pointed out that my buddy sold his house. Yes, he had a house even though he was living with me, and for a life-changing amount of money, which he used to travel for a while before coming back to this area. There continue to be odd circumstances around the house. We've seen odd footprints in snow and mud outside of the house on the patio, and around the cars. We've heard noises in the basement and around the house. Once, the steps to the attic had been pulled down and left open for some reason. I wake up sometimes with inexplicable scratches on my head, arms or legs, but again, all superficial, I don't have any scars from them. At this point, I can't rule out cats. I'd scratch me in my sleep too, if I'm used for a dust rag for kicks. The running joke is that Charlie needs to come out of his pockets if he's gonna harass the household. My life is on the upturn now, but I certainly didn't receive what I was expecting for the offer I made. The girls have told me they think I let something loose that is essentially angry with me that my deal isn't weighted in its favor, so it's stuck being a minor annoyance. While I make fun of it for not giving me any of my loot, 3030 is a fair trade and I stand by it, and it'll need to make more than a trivial paw print to change my mind on that. When I was growing up in the 60s on Long Island, I adored my Aunt Elizabeth. She's my dad's baby sister, 12 years younger and 17 years older than me. 
She was a flight attendant for a major carrier, and lived in an apartment in the city with a classic Italian beauty, petite with beautiful olive skin, green eyes, and jet black hair. She doted on me, and I loved the pictures and gifts that she'd bring for me from other parts of the country, and sometimes even Europe. When I got older, my parents would let me go visit her apartment, where she and her equally gorgeous and glamorous friends would smoke cigarettes, drink cocktails and play records and talk about glamorous and adult things together. And I would feel sophisticated and cool merely by being in the room. One day, when she was 30, she was called in sick to work. Thinking she had the flu, it turned out to be meningitis. And she was dead within two days. What followed were the saddest events of my childhood. One of three times I saw my father cry, big, racking sobs was as he was dressing for the wake. I remember Aunt Elizabeth laid out at the wake, wearing her flight attendant uniform, still beautiful. I remember how soft and lovely the cream-coloured satin lining her casket felt. So many people came to her funeral, that people just spilled out on the sidewalk next to our little suburban Catholic church. Sunday dinners with my grandparents and aunts and uncles never felt the same. Ironically, this niece of a flight attendant from the golden age of air has always been terrified of air travel. I used to travel quite frequently for work, and on some long-haul flights I would be unable to cope without the help from a whole bottle of red wine in Ambien. A few months ago, I decided I want to drop that. It's not exactly healthy. So on my first flight across the country in a while, I took 10 milligrams of melatonin, sat in my seat anxiously, and tried to fall asleep. Eventually I did, and what followed were terrifying dreams. Of course, it would take place on the same flight, and of course the cabin pressure would drop, and of course the plane would be plummeting, and I was about to die crashing into a cornfield. As everyone panicked and screamed, I saw a flight attendant walking down the aisle to my seat, and it was my Aunt Elizabeth. She was walking calmly and intently with a little sly smile on her face, as if I were an old friend of hers who she hadn't seen in a long time. She was wearing the same flight attendant uniform she was buried in, but her legs and feet were bare. She came, looked at me, took my left hand in hers and said, It'll be okay, honey. It really will. Things can look bad, and sometimes it gets a little turbulent, but the pilot will write it. And then said, How are you? I sputtered out the first thing that came to mind if asked, what have you done with your life since age 13? I think I mentioned where I went to school, and something about my first job, something about cell phones, and how much she would have loved them. I said my dad had passed, but my mum and sister were doing fine. I talked about how ridiculous rents were in the city, and about the changes that had happened to our hometown. As I was babbling, I noticed the plane returning to normal. The pressure coming back, people calming down, and the dream ended shortly before everything returned to normality. Aunt Elizabeth's hand on my shoulder. I woke up 30 minutes before landing. I was so stunned by this dream. I hadn't really thought about Aunt Elizabeth or about her in detail for years. I had a few minutes. So I called my mother and told her what happened. I mentioned that I thought it strange that in the dream she was barefoot while working on the plane. And my mother paused and said, Elizabeth was buried barefoot. Apparently, it's custom in the little corner of Sicily that my father's family comes from, for women to be buried barefoot when laid to rest. And they'd adhere to it when burying Aunt Elizabeth 
and my grandmother many years later. I would not have known, as the lower lid of her casket was closed during the wake. I am not even religious, but that made me truly believe that my Aunt Elizabeth came to visit me and comfort me during a time of stress and fear, or something like her, a piece of her. It was wonderful and moving to realize this, like a warm blanket around me. I suddenly recalled memories of my aunt that I didn't even know I had. I was in tears in an airport bathroom. I've been through a lot in my life, some moves, unemployment, two divorces, losing a house, and getting one back, friends and family dying. But for a few moments in a dream I got to see someone who I loved, and who loved me when I was a little girl, excited for the big world ahead of her. I love you, Aunt Elizabeth. Visit again, anytime. About 10 years ago or so, my family and I brought back these small vases, who we were told were 400 years old from Machu Picchu. The vases were made from mud, and had a face carved on them. We were given them by a family friend, who said he wanted to give us something special for visiting Peru. He claims he brought them from a local in the Pisco region of Peru where Machu Picchu is. We brought it back home to Canada, and pretty much from week one, a horrible streak of bad luck and accidents began to happen to our family. My mum came down with cataract at a very young age, my father lost both his jobs, my brother and I were both constantly sick, and my little sister would start screaming randomly. Pretty much on the verge of being homeless, we were looking for things to sell and came across these things. We didn't know if we could even sell them, and for how much. To get an idea of the value, we called one of my dad's friends in Peru, who had worked in a museum. After a bit of back and forth, he told my dad that these types of items are not meant to leave its home soil, and are not worth more than a few bucks. He said that these items are probably cursed. He said to lift the curse, we prick our fingers and smear a little bit of blood on each one and send them back. Now of course, we were very skeptical, and thought they were probably worth something. We assumed the guy wanted them so that he could sell them. I mean, a blood sacrifice? That's ridiculous. Fast forward two days, my mother and father get into a pretty nasty car accident. We were okay, but they both needed to be off work for a few weeks. After that, they both decided that maybe we should send them back and do the blood thing. We send them back, and the next week after that, things got noticeably better. My father found a very good job, as did my mum. We found a really good place to live with a very low rent and overall better health. What do you guys think? Coincidence or cursed parts? Currently, my boys are eight and six. At the time, they were four and two. We had been living in a place for about five to six months, and my oldest, who isn't firing on any cylinders to be honest, kept walking to the corner, looking up, and talking. He was still doing a lot of babbling until he was almost six, and then after a few times he walked over, grabbed his younger brother by the hand, walked him to the corner, and he also looked up, started talking, and they were both smiling and giggling, like an adult was interacting with them. After my youngest's third trip over, I asked, what in the world are you two doing? Thinking it was some kind of game. My oldest giggled and said, I'm talking to grandpa. I'm confused. Baby, your grandpa lives in Nebraska. He's very far away. My child looks at me and replies, no, mummy. It's your grandpa. As I said, my oldest was still doing a lot of babbling. So for him to suddenly speak so clearly and in a complete coherent thought was very unnerving. 
I look at the corner. Both my boys are talking and showing toys up to the corner. I watch for a few minutes. This all happened over a grand total of about half hour. Babies, come watch your movie so mum can finish dinner, because little ones have zero logic. The younger one waddles over and sits down. The eldest picks up the toys that had accumulated in the corner and put them away and sat next to his brother. I start dinner and I keep looking at the corner. Shot in the dark. Thanks, Grandpa. The door in the corner fell open like someone walked through it and there was a heightened feeling in the room afterwards. That night, I had a dream of my childhood home. And on the path back to the woods, there was a small building, granite like a mausoleum, but was little more than an awning. One wall that held a door, four pillars, and a bench swing. I walked to it, and lit an incense and sat on the swing, and started rocking, staring at the ground. Then, there they were, those old ratty sneakers. My grandpa was sitting next to me with that smile, sitting on the swing. I just started talking, mostly about the boys. I told him I missed him so much that I named my oldest after him. He just sat and listened with that smile on his face. After a while, we both stood up. I hugged him and told him I hadn't told him everything yet. Then my name was called from somewhere. I looked around, didn't see anyone, but I looked back and he was gone. I yanked the door open, and it went into this vertical shaft, endless in both directions, completely lined with doors. I woke up crying amidst a panic attack. My grandfather died in about 05, my grandmother in 08, and my son was born in 2010, just one week shy of my grandfather's birthday which happened to be the day the doctor scheduled me to originally be induced. When my sister was quite young, our grandmother bought her a porcelain doll. The doll wasn't anything special. It wasn't an antique or anything like that. It was just one that you would buy at a novelty shop. It was on a stand and couldn't be moved without possibly breaking it. She had this doll for a few years before my parents divorced. After the divorce, we moved in with our mother in a poor neighborhood in Alton, Illinois. The house felt strange. It also had a strange smell. My sister put the doll in one of the built-in cabinets in the wall, and that's where she stayed for the first few days. At first, we started to notice small changes about where she was or how she was positioned differently than she was before. She would be on the shelf facing the living room most of the time. And when you left the room and came back, she would be rotated a different way. Okay, we thought. Mum's probably messing with us. We largely ignored it, but it kept happening. After a few more months, the doll started ending up in different places in the house. She would be on the cabinet, and when you came back from another room, she would be on the dining room table, or she would be on one side of the table in the living room by the couch, or on the floor facing the television. We had made a lot of new friends in the neighborhood, and when they came over, I would show them what the doll would do, and without a hitch, I would put her somewhere, and we would leave the room for a few minutes and return, and she would now be in a different spot. Now, I'll go back to saying that we thought my mum was messing with us at first, but mum was at work a lot of those days, and we skipped school plenty of times to stay home, so it wasn't mum doing this. One day, we decided to mess with the Ouija board I had in my closet. I don't remember if we bought it, or it was just there. The messages coming back from the questions we asked identified a spirit called Candy Zimmerman. She didn't say much, but I also being able to connect with her myself by the board. 
She said she had a crush on me. One day I skipped school again, but my sister went and I always walked with my buddy down to the bus stop and hung out with him before heading back home. And I watched my sister get on the bus. My mum worked early, so she wasn't there that day. Then I went back to the house and locked up. And since I was still tired, I opted to go back to bed. The next thing that happened, I will never forget. I heard a knock at my bedroom door. It startled me awake, but I ignored it and laid my head back down. After a few minutes, there was another knock. This one much louder and in a rhythm. I still also remember to this day. Think shave and haircut rhythm, but different. This time I was freaked out and laid there with my eyes open for I don't know how long. The door to my bedroom was heavy and it always stuck in warmer weather, which it was. The next thing that happened was the door popped open just enough for me to see out into the hallway, but not enough for me to see over the edge of my bed. I sat up in bed and looked down on the floor. And there standing at the entrance to my room was that doll on its stand looking at me. Before the fear set in, I was actually pissed off. Did my sister come back? Was she messing with me? I got up, took the doll by the hair and carried her out into the living room. No one was there. I checked the front door and it was locked. I barged to my sister's room and no one was there. I barged into my mum's room. No one was home. At this point, I was freaking out. I took the doll to my sister's room and threw her in the closet. I buried her in a stack of bags full of old clothes and boxes of junk and shut the door. I spent the rest of the day sitting on the front porch, waiting for mum to come home. It never happened again. And I made sure to have a friend or local Wiccan bind the Ouija board which she kept. We moved out of the house a year later, and after a few more paranormal incidences. As for the doll, after we moved back in with my father, she was in my bedroom closet for about five years. One day we cleaned it out and threw her away. Was the doll haunted? I don't know. It could have just been that house and whatever it was, moving things around. I was 10 or 11 years old and was sleeping in my grandma's guest bedroom. Next to the bed was an antique easy chair. When I woke up next morning, I looked over towards the chair and sitting there was a little girl. She had dark hair that was done up in pigtails and tied by a blue ribbon. She wore an old fashioned dress of the early 1900s. And initially, I was startled to see her. I was even more startled to see through her. She just looked at me and smiled. She did a small wave and mouthed the words, Hello. I said hello back. And she faded. That was my first experience with a ghost. Months later, it was Easter Sunday. My sister and I were staying the night at my grandma's house so that we could receive our Easter basket and hunt for eggs. I woke up early to get a peek at the Easter baskets. I slipped out of bed and walked quietly to the living room. The early morning sunshine was brightly streaming through the windows and into the living room. Sitting on the couch was the little girl. I smiled and waved hello again, and she smiled and waved back. I told her it was great to see her, and she emphatically nodded that it was good to see me too. My grandma must have heard me talking to someone, because she woke up and told me to go back to bed, that it was still far too early to hunt for eggs. I looked at my grandmother and then back at the couch. The little girl was gone. That was the last time I saw the little girl with the blue ribbons in her hair. My grandma moved from there shortly after into a new place. However, my friend Melissa ended up moving into where my grandma lived. And she claims to have seen the little girl with the ribbons in her hair. During the same period, 
My mum, sister, and I were all living in a trailer on my great uncle Wilbert's property, a large cattle ranch. We were staying there while my dad was stationed in Okinawa, Japan. On this property in the mid 80s, Uncle Wilbert had built a two story building. Everybody called it the tower. Windows faced each direction on the top floor, the largest one faced towards Highway 99. Wilbert believed that you could learn much from observing the 99. In the evening, he would often go up to the tower, watch TV, and keep watch over the cattle. In the lower portion of the tower is where my family kept our clothes and food. One night, Mum had instructed my sister and I to go to the bottom of the tower to pick out our breakfast for the next morning. Trisha was in the middle of doing something, so I offered to grab breakfast for her. I entered the bottom floor of the tower, chose a handful of Pop-Tarts, and above me I could hear the TV. So I assumed Uncle Wilbert was up in the tower. I stepped out the bottom half and looked up towards the large window to see if Wilbert was there. The TV was, but Wilbert wasn't in the tower. Instead, there was a family, a mother, father, little girl and boy. I thought that it was strange they were up there as Wilbert hardly ever had visitors. Another strange thing was that they weren't watching a TV. Instead, they were sitting on the couch and staring out the window towards Highway 99. They didn't move. They were all sitting with perfect posture and hands settled on their laps. Even though I thought it was unusual, I just returned to the trailer and didn't say anything to my mum about it. The next day, I asked Uncle Wilbert who his guests were, and he looks at me with a confused look on his face. He hadn't had any guests last night, and nobody by that description. Who were those people? A few months after that, I had gone down to the bottom of the tower again to grab my breakfast for the next morning. I went in, grabbed some oatmeal, and as I was closing the door behind me, I looked up to the landing that leads to the door on the top floor. Looking over the landing, was a woman dressed in a white flowing dress. She herself was as white as the dress, and the woman's hair and dress blew in a non-existent wind. She looked down at me. She smiled, did a slow, long, graceful wave, and despite this friendly gesture, I was terrified. She reminded me of the depiction of banshees that I had seen in movies. I ran back to the trailer, and told my mum about what I'd seen. She exited the trailer and took the stairs up to the top of the tower. She opened the tower door and no one was there. We knew the lady couldn't have gotten down the stairs because the windows on the trailer faced directly towards the stairway, and we didn't see anyone come down. Most of the friends of the family know that the tower is haunted. I believe that it sits on some kind of vortex. Though my family no longer lives on the property, I still see spirits from time to time. I call them my visitors. I don't try and communicate with them, nor they me. They just appear, and as quickly as they come, they are gone. I was going to my sister's graduation in Binghamton University and my family rented out a well-priced Airbnb for two nights. The only one that had five bedrooms, because extended Chinese family. It was a Victorian era house, completely decked out with Victorian American aesthetics. Trinkets, paintings of serious children, photos of even more serious children, ornate floral wallpaper and dolls. Many dolls. We were picking up bedrooms, and no one in my family wanted the room with the creepy dolls. I'm not superstitious, and I didn't see the room, and I didn't understand the gravity of the situation. So I was like, sure, I'll take the room with the dolls. You see where this is going. As midnight approached, I got tired, even after being energized by a tiny bite of baklava and an espresso. 
so I was the first to go to bed. I went into the room and saw the dolls. They were locked inside a glass case, all facing the bed. Don't be silly, I thought. You're a brave trans girl, and they're probably more afraid of you than you are of them. Because you're something they've likely never encountered before. Silly thoughts. I decided to take out my black ebony handled opinal pocket knife and slept with it at the nightstand. So I would have some protection. I watched YouTube for a while, turned off the lamp and went under the covers. I felt the doll staring. But my rational side told me it was all in my head. By 3am, I was half conscious, slipping in and out of pure unconsciousness. While I was in a dreamlike state, I was aware of everything going on around me. The dolls staring. Were they next to me? I was afraid to open my eyes. I blinked. And I thought, it's okay, I have protection. I didn't dare look at the ebony handled knife on the nightstand. I was afraid I'd see a doll next to me. Then I remembered statistically armed victims of assault tend to have their weapons taken away and used against them. And I thought, my gosh, I'm going to get stabbed. Then I heard vividly a playful childlike voice. It would be my heart's desire. I immediately became alert, like R2D2 rebooting after being in low power mode. Adrenaline rushed through me. I heard a ringing in my ear as my awareness went from zero to 60 in a split second. I stayed like that until the sun started to rise at around 5am. That was when I fell asleep. When I woke up, I dreaded having to sleep there again for yet another night. The next night I thought, you know what? Violence begets violence. So I slept with my pocket knife in my bag instead. And I fell asleep and slept through the night. When I was maybe nine or 10, my mum worked at the hospital for the graveyard shift. Me and my sister would usually sleep when she left. My sister was five at the time and we were playing in the living room. We had a huge TV in there and two remotes for our TV because we had the same type of TV in my older sister's room. The remote for the TV in the living room was on the couch, but the remotes could be used for either room. So we were playing and suddenly the TV switches on. It made some weird noises and then the 10 o'clock news started playing as normal. Me and my sister were scared out of our minds because neither of us had touched the remotes. Our cats were in the other room and we both slept in my older sister's room because this was a two bedroom. And we ran into her room and saw that she was asleep too. And the remote was on the dresser across the room from the bed. I woke her up and she comforted us. It isn't that scary in retrospect, but I was a little kid and it took me forever to fall asleep that night. I've always known my house was haunted. I remember as a kid, I had this weird thing I always did before walking out of my room. I poke my head out and check both ends of the hall like you would check if a car is coming across an alley. I did that, looked into the void of the darkness that was my dining room, nothing. But when I turned to the kitchen, I swear I saw a red tinted figure just standing there doing nothing. The bathroom was across the hall, and I really needed to go. But I remember starting to cry in fear before turning back into my room, flipping the light on and hiding under the cover. I never saw that red figure again. So I just like to pretend it was a figure of my imagination. But anytime I think of it, I'm still worried if it's real, or if I'm just crazy. I've had several strange experiences happen at my dad's house. There was a hand mark on the wall in my dad's house like a print from someone with dirty hands, a really big hand, nothing extreme, just big. And every time we would wipe it off, it would come back the next day. Whatever was in my dad's house seemingly also targeted his girlfriend, 
Almost every time she was alone in the house, she would hear noises of doors opening or faint whispering in other rooms. I heard the whispering too, loud enough to hear it, but not loud enough to actually understand what they were saying. There was this one time my dad's girlfriend was showering and felt a hand on her shoulder. She turned around and there was nothing and then remembered she was home alone. One other time when she was cooking, a can of beans was thrown out of the cabinet to her head. My dad also reported seeing people around his bed at night. I've seen a little girl in old clothes from the corner of my eye several times from when I was there. They now try to control it by burning incense and sage, something prescribed in specialized rituals. It became something quite normal to me generally. I've experienced way more stuff though, much to my dismay. This story is from my parents, who bought a house and were fixing it up. Apparently the family before them were an elderly couple who had a grandson living with them. And one day the grandson died by getting hit by a car right outside or from the flu. I can't remember which one exactly. My mum was there painting and left the brush in a certain spot, came back later and found it elsewhere. My aunt and uncle would help out some days. And one day my aunt was there by herself and was about to leave and the water upstairs turned on by itself. So she went to turn it off and went back downstairs only for it to turn on again. She freaked out and left. Finally, there was the time my uncle was there. He was preparing to leave and the light switch on a chain at the top of the stairs began dangling. He left pretty quickly after that. When I was around 12 to 14, I lived in my own house where some unexplainable things happened, like cupcakes falling over and chairs moving. But there's one memory that sticks with me and gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. I share a bedroom with my twin and we had bunk beds. I was the top bunk. One night I woke up at around 3.30 AM and was trying to go back to sleep when suddenly out of complete silence, I hear a creak from the bottom of the stairs. It was an old house and I'd been living in it since I was born. So I figured it was just it being old. The sound slowly made its way up the stairs and I was facing the door, which was slightly open to where I could see into the hallway, but not the stairs. So I just froze in fear. Once it reached the top, it stopped and I pretended to be asleep, but had my eyes slightly open to see if I could see whatever it was. The noise was so chilling. It finally stopped after five minutes, but felt like forever. I then had the balls to turn over and stuff my face into my pillow to try and fall asleep. The next morning I walked downstairs and found all the chairs huddled up in the middle of the kitchen. I ended up moving out of that house and haven't experienced anything like that again. I've had a few paranormal experiences all within the house I lived in as a child. The first time I ever truly remembered one was when I was in high school. It was late and I had just said goodnight to my family. I went into my room, closed the door, and got ready for bed. As I was laying down in bed, no more than five to 10 minutes after resting, I felt what seemed to be a handprint pressing against the edge of my bed near my feet. I bolted up, expecting to see my younger brother. However, upon inspection, no one was there. In fact, I could hear my little brother joking with my mom in the kitchen, which wasn't too far from my room but there was no way he could have snuck out without me noticing since there was a large space between the foot of my bed and the door. Freaked out, I bolted from my room, panicked and tried to put as much distance between my bed and I. I saw my brother and mum staring at me in bewilderment as I ran into the kitchen in hysterics as I attempted to explain to them, 
but was told it was all in my head and go back to bed. I was ashamed and embarrassed since I had no proof to what I experienced, but I knew it wasn't in my head. And I had enough people later who experienced things in that house to prove me right. Me and my sister stayed at my mum's a couple of years ago, and we both had to stay in my sister's old room that she always hated. She said spooky stuff used to happen all the time when she was younger, but we just kind of shrugged it off as an overactive imagination. It's about 2am, and we've pretty much talked about anything and everything. When I ask if she can turn the light off, since I'm pretty tired and want to sleep, and I kid you not, about three minutes after the lights are off, we hear this super low rough growling, like the noise the grudge makes before she attacks. I asked like a 10 year old, was that you? No, was that you? Turn the lights on, turn the lights on. Of course, the lamp falls off the dresser as she's trying to turn it on while we're both in full panic mode. See, I told you the room is freaky. I laughed nervously, but we slept with the light on that night. Can't even put it down to us being kids. We were in our early 20s. I had other freaky things happen in that room, but I just put it down to lucid dreams. A few years ago, this happened to a friend. He was on vacation at his grandfather's place in a rural area, basically the middle of nowhere, with the closest neighbor being kilometers away from them. Like with any countryside building, there is no proper plumbing in the house, so the restroom was just outside. It was about 3 a.m., the night pitch black, when my friend decided to go to the restroom. Using his torch on his phone, he made his way to find it did his thing, and right before leaving he took a photo. He had opened the restroom door ajar to take a snap on Snapchat of all the darkness surrounding him. The idea was to show all the friends how brave he was in the dark alone. He almost dropped his phone, because the latter wasn't true. In the picture there was a door on the left, with the empty void just next to it. But in the dark, if you look, it seems like a couple is standing facing the camera. The man looks like he's wearing a suit, and the woman in front wearing a red dress. He was really shaken about the image he'd just taken. So, he quickly wrote, take a screenshot, and hit send to everyone including me, while trying to muster up the confidence to return back to his house. The explanation? We still don't really know what caused it, it may 100% be an illusion, just under the right angle. It may also be Photoshop, but he hasn't told us it was a joke in all these years. I still have it saved on my desktop, and I still get shivers whenever I see it. About a month ago, I was sitting at the lunch table with my six close friends, like any other day at school. Something was off that day because my friend, Amanda, looked kind of nervous. It wasn't long before she told me she was going to tell me something later. I told her it's okay, and she could tell me now. So she did. Back in late July, Amanda played the Ouija board with another friend of ours, and she was scared that I was going to be disappointed because we are Catholic. I told her it's okay, and that she can do what she wants and that I won't ever judge her. Anyway, Amanda asked me if I remembered when she played the Ouija board. I said, what about it? And she said she didn't really tell me what the ghost told her. She told me that they met a ghost called Nick that died of obesity. Amanda said he wasn't evil. So basically what happened was Nick told Amanda and my other friend that Amanda was going to die before she was 20. Amanda told me that he also said she was going to die because she was going to be thrown into a river by a close friend. I started to panic, thinking this was me. I asked her 
Who? And she said that our other friend called Becca. I looked beside me and saw Becca talking to our other friends and not paying any attention to us. I was scared. I asked if she was lying and she says she swears that she's telling the truth and that she will put her hand on the Bible and say she isn't lying. I asked if she or any of our other friends were moving the planchette and she says no, as they promised not to move it before they played. I always told her not to mess around with ghosts or Ouija boards and I feel scared. I would also like to add that the other friend that played confirmed the story. I just don't know what to think of it. About six years ago, I lived in a small town where everyone knew everyone. My grandmother lived a few miles away from us in the middle of the woods. I used to love her house, but looking back that house was pure horror. They had a hundred acres of woods and not a house in sight. There was an old abandoned barn they used for storage for tools, but the rest of the property was unused. I was a kid, first to second grade, and every time I visited I would sleep in a spare bedroom, aka the kids room. The kids room had a glass case mounted on the wall with at least 50 dolls all aligned looking straight forward. My great grandmother collected vintage dolls from every state and I was always petrified of that room, but didn't have much of a choice. One night, me and my sister are sleeping in the room, sharing the same bed when I wake up. The room is completely black, except for the dim hallway light. I remember seeing one of the doors of the case open and one of the dolls started moving. Another time I was in the kids room alone. I couldn't sleep because of what I saw last time and that's when I noticed one of the dolls was out of place. Its head was facing the door. And this was odd because they were all mounted to the case and couldn't move. The doll's head began to slowly turn and look at me. I was off center to the left, so there's no way it wasn't paranormal. I sat there sweating bullets under my blanket, too afraid to yell for my grandma, and I eventually passed out. And when I woke up, the dolls were facing forward again. They have moved out the house since, and I think the dolls are in storage, but they still own part of their land and use it for camping. My grandmother is almost 60, and I'm in really bad shape. My aunt just left her to go to college, so my family decided to move her in with us. My mother and I were almost done pulling all of my grandma's stuff in storage. It was pretty late, about two in the morning, and the house's power goes out, and we're on our way back to the house getting the very last of the stuff, and I looked at my mum and said, Hey mum, I know this sounds weird, but I wish I had more paranormal experiences in my life. She laughed and said something not important. We finally made it back to the house and I realized my grandma's cat was in one of the rooms in a pet carrier. So I knocked on the door and said the cat's name. I walked away and all I heard from that room was a cat hiss and then knock, knock, knock. I'm only 15 and don't normally curse in front of my mother, but I ran out of the house screaming holy shit. She asked what's wrong, and I said that I knocked on the room with the cat, and it knocked back. And then she told me, that was knocking? I thought you dropped something. She heard the knocking and she wasn't even inside the house. Sadly, I had to go back in and get the cat, and on my way off the front porch, me and my mum both heard something. And the best way to explain it was when you wake up from a very deep sleep and all they do is make a groaning sound, that kind of sound. We got into the car as fast as we could and drove away. We told my grandmother about what happened and she told us that she heard the knocking coming from that door every night. It would wake her up and make her think someone was breaking in. And I even remember her telling us about it a few weeks ago. I haven't been back to the house since.
Three years ago, my daughter attempted suicide and ended up in CICU for six days, an inpatient directly after for five days. When she came home, unexplainable things started happening. We had lived here for 11 years, and prior to this, nothing had ever happened. We were finding animals that had been dead a very long time on our back porch steps. Two carcasses to be exact. A knife flew off our kitchen counter while no one was in the room. We even put the knife back on the counter and jumped to see if it would rattle off. It didn't move. My daughter confided in me that she felt a demon followed her from the hospital. She would sleep at night with headphones so she wouldn't hear the demon telling her things. I did call a local paranormal research team out to the house, and they found a spirit named Adam and a dark entity. They wanted to come back after they went through all the evidence, but my husband said no. The scariest thing that has happened to me in our house was when I was in bed, and I felt like something was there. I opened my eyes just to appease my senses, not really thinking anything was there, and a very large, very tall, completely black figure was at the end of my bed. When I realized that half of the TV screen was blocked by this figure, I screamed and covered my head up. When I looked again, I just saw the TV and the dresser as normal. My daughter has been in and out of several facilities since the first attempt, six times in fact, and is a shard of the girl I knew and raised. I used to be fit and cared about my body, but I don't anymore. I have feelings of my own every day about taking my own life, but it's like they aren't mine if that makes sense. I'm not suicidal, but somehow my mind thinks that I need to perish. It's so hard to explain, and sometimes I wonder if I'm feeling my daughter's thoughts. The most consistent physical thing in our house that happens is light bulbs exploding or blinking. I was using the bathroom and two light bulbs exploded and glass went everywhere. It was so loud and so much that glass went all the way into our bathtub. Our living room lights explode frequently, but never two at a time. Are we just going through a rough time in life? Or is there something more sinister going on? This is no joke. It is very real to us, and I don't know what to do about it. Any thoughts or opinions would be incredibly appreciated. I can still remember this quite vividly. A little background first. At the time I lived in this creepy older house, a dual unit Victorian, and sometimes me and my older sister would notice an unexplainable shadow from the corner of our eye, even at the same time. We never let it seriously bother us, and anyway, there was always an adult round with an earshot. My mum just picked me up from school, and right when we arrive at home, she mentions that she forgot to buy an ingredient for dinner, and says that we need to go to the market. I politely refuse, since I really wanted to watch The Transformers, as it was one of the five-day special linked series. I think it was The Return of Optimus Prime, which was about to start. And hell, I'm a big kid now, a sixth grader. I'll be fine. She asks again to make sure, and I assure her again, that we both know that the neighbours, who are actually our relatives, are home, and I can go there if anything comes up. Before my mum leaves, she talks to the neighbours to mention that I'm home. Rejoice. Free at last. I'm the man of the house. Immediately, I turn on the kitchen TV and break out my Lego to play on the kitchen table. So I'm watching Transformers while playing with my Lego, and I fumble with a piece which lands past the doorway into the adjoining hallway. I ignore it, since I didn't want to miss a moment of Transformers. After 10 minutes later, I notice the shadow in the corner of my eye, right where the Lego lies on the floor. I am freaked out a bit, to the point that the hairs on the back of my neck are standing up. But hell, Transformers is on, and I'm a big kid, and decide to turn the volume up on the TV. 
Minutes pass. I've forgotten all about the Lego and I'm fully engrossed watching Optimus Prime do his thing. Then suddenly, something hits me on the side of the head and I distinctly hear a click click sound as the Lego lands on Lego. My internal alarm goes off and I slowly turn my head towards the Lego piece in the hallway. It's not there. Screw this, I'm out. And a moment later, I'm at my neighbors banging on the door. I've never been into paranormal stuff because I've had enough activity happen to me over the years. Over this last summer, my friends and I decided it was a good idea to make our own Ouija board and play it at their house and also at the cemetery. They asked it stuff that I knew was true and they did not. Right there, I could sense it was a real thing. Then out of curiosity, my friend Karen goes, will our friend Penny be pregnant at age 19? And it said yes. Fast forward a few months, and I get a phone call from Penny saying she's actually pregnant. And in that moment, I've never been so awestruck and freaked out at the same time. Nothing like that has ever worked. And now I'm a little more freaked out that I know the board worked. I cannot believe that it came true and that the board predicted something as insane like that. I kind of am excited about the other stuff we asked, but it was also very leery of it too. I live with my husband in a large house in the country. We live right next to a large field and past that is a wheat field. We love to take our pit bulls out for runs out there. There is a street running horizontally from the field as we do live in a very tiny subdivision out in the middle of nowhere. This happened in June or July of 2014. I was sitting on the bed talking to my mom on the phone at around 11 p.m. at night. My husband was in the study down the hall. The two windows in our master bedroom face outside into the backyard. Everything was normal until I heard what sounded like a plane landing in our backyard. Only it didn't sound like a plane engine in the slightest. It was so close to the windows and the ground that the house shook. It was so loud that I couldn't hear my mum clearly anymore. Well, this noise freaked my cat out, so she bolted to hide under my dresser. I told my mum to hold on as I rushed to the back door to see what in the world was making such a loud explosive engine noise. And that's when I heard the explosion. Great, now whatever is in the backyard exploded. I threw the door open and see nothing, not a darn thing, and it's silent. Not a car, not a person, not a plane, nothing. I assumed that an 18 wheeler must have crashed outside. Perhaps they needed help. So I ran around into the front yard and looked up and down the horizontal road by the field looking for a crash. Nothing. All noise was gone. I looked up the street next to us as well. No one heard it. I was the lone dingbat outside at 11pm. I went back inside and told my mum I'd call her back because now I'm freaked out and I just heard World War 3 happen and there's no explanation from where it came from. I then asked my husband if he heard anything, and he told me he felt the house shake a bit, but he was gaming with his headphones on so didn't hear a thing. Apparently, Castile, our pit bull, didn't hear anything either. She didn't bark or stir. I hope I explained this well enough, because I'd really like to know what I heard. The noises had to have come from somewhere, right? I don't understand how our neighbors behind us didn't come barreling out of their house looking around for the noises like I did. Any insight would be appreciated. I was 16 and bored at my girlfriend's cousin's place. Thai people are a bunch of superstitious people. I'm only half, but my girlfriend, her cousin, her friend, are a hundred percent Thai. We decide to make a Ouija board, just write letters and numbers on a piece of print paper. We decide to light candles and politely ask spirits to join us. Freaky how the coin we pushed around 
seemed to move so quickly and accurately, spelling out names of our future boyfriends and girlfriends. It was easy for me to blame Joey, the most excited of the bunch for manipulating the coin. We decided to put our Ouija to the test. My girlfriend volunteered to have the only finger on the coin while the rest of us just touched her elbow. We also asked her to close her eyes and look up away from the board and asked a couple of questions. After receiving no response, we asked our final question. Is anyone here? My girlfriend screamed and we jumped away to witness. We saw her crying as the coin spelled stop. Her eyes still closed, face towards the ceiling and tears running down her cheeks. It continued for 30 seconds and finally let her go. We tore the piece of paper up, flushed it down the toilet and sat stunned and speechless. My girlfriend said she had absolutely no control of her body and wanted to look down and jump away from the board, but she couldn't. I will never forget that night, and I've been convinced of the unknown ever since. When I was a kid visiting New Orleans, my family went to a voodoo shop. I wish I could remember the name, but it wasn't one of the tourist attraction ones. It was hard to find and not like all the others. Anyway, I thought it'd be cool to buy this little black doll made from cloth that had no face or features, just black cloth in human shape, stuffed and sewn together. It was sold as a voodoo doll of death. And thinking back on it, I feel pretty dumb taking something like that home with me. Once back, many weird things started happening to my whole family, until we eventually moved because of it. Hearing whispering in my room late at night in an unintelligible language was common. I also heard an angry man say my name behind my ear as I was turning on the living room TV. I literally felt his breath. None of this my family believed when I would tell them. I was under 12, so it's understandable. What changed this and made us move the next day is this. My mum saw an orb come up to her face when she was almost sleeping, and she said she couldn't breathe for almost a minute while it was in her face. Then it flew into the corner of the room and disappeared. When we moved close by, and the new people in the house we made friends with started saying that their kids were hearing whispers at night, we never told them about this before when they mentioned it, which is the crazy part. I'm not certain if this is all tied to the doll or not, but other stories I've heard have made me think it might be. Two years ago, my family moved into a very nice apartment complex in the Houston, Texas area. We were looking for a nice complex and went in and was told by the assistant manager they had a model apartment that was used for viewings up the grabs. She mentioned that it had not been occupied for a long time, but she was willing to give it to us. We moved in a month later without giving it much thought. The apartment had a studio slash attic that was connected to the stairway. The attic slash studio was open, and from the attic, you could see the living room looking down. Every time the maintenance people had to do something, they were very quick to leave and not mingle around too much in the apartment. The maintenance manager once made a remark and said, I never thought they were going to lease this apartment again. When asked why, he was very quick to change the subject to avoid answering our question. I'm a graveyard shift nurse, and my wife and kids stay at home alone four times out of the week. During my days off, I stay up at night watching TV. I noticed in the living room, close to the stairs, a heavy cold presence, as if someone was looking at the between hours of 1 to 4 am every time. I felt a presence watching me at these times, to the point where I would oftentimes leave the living room. I felt somebody was at the stairwell looking down on me. Fast forward a year, and we had moved out, and me and my family moved into our first new home. 
I told my wife randomly that I felt comfortable in this new home and didn't feel a bad energy watching me. My wife turned pale as snow and asked, you felt the same energy too watching you from the stairway at early morning hours too? We both turned pale, as we both realized at that moment, we had lived in an apartment that housed a spirit. To this day, we don't know exactly what happened. Our assumption is that someone ended their own life by jumping from the studio attic into the living room. The management locked the unit for a long time and then decided to lease it again. To this day, no one in the complex will open up and talk about what happened in apartment 2811. I scared a bunch of people on night shift. I pre-recorded some murmuring and random words like, hello, you've made a big mistake, on my phone, then got a Bluetooth speaker and set it in a room. Why? Because we had planned to play the Ouija board. The place I used to work at was nice. The median age of employees was roughly 23, and it was about 30 of us altogether. All of them were friends, but some of us were mischievous. Pranking each other was a daily routine, and often the CEO and COO were involved. They were always involved after the fact, when everyone laughed at the poor soul who got pranked on. One night, someone suggested we play the Ouija board, and I couldn't pass the opportunity to mess with everyone. The Bluetooth speaker was a tiny one. The only problem was that it had a blue light which would be visible in a dark room. So I put tape over that and placed it inside an open box and had my cell phone connected. I was one of the biggest skeptics in the office, so if I could act scared, it would be very convincing. I used an office iPad to record the event and everyone was aware of the recording. We sat down and started holding hands, so I couldn't just take out my phone to play the audio. This is where my genius becomes tangible. I had set it up as five minutes of silence before audio started. And five minutes later, the question on the table was, is someone here? And amazingly, a voice came saying, hello? Everyone freaked out. It was just perfect. Perfect timing. Then the murmurs started, then a whispering voice said, don't mess with us. Followed by numerous murmurs, and then, Mark killed me. He killed me. I had to act freaked out. One slip and I would give it all away, and then a co-worker of mine let go of the hand and fell to the floor. He passed out. We turned on the lights and a few seconds later he came too. We gave him water and calmed him down. Seeing the collective scare on my co-workers and brilliant execution, I thought the best way to honor it would be not to tell them what I did. It's been a few years, and I'm sure there are five guys out there still telling people how they experienced a real ghost killed by someone called Mark. Shortly after we moved into our new house, my brother found a couple of used bullets and shells under the basement stairs. The bullets were pretty destroyed, so he threw them away but kept the shells. They looked like handgun bullets, maybe 9mm or something. We didn't think much of it, but within a year, we started noticing weird things. One day we heard scratching at our door. All three dogs were inside, and when we opened it up, there was nothing in the yard. Even creepier was the fact that, that sometimes in the snow, we would find a dog track far too large to be our own dogs in the yard. We thought it might just be our imagination, but one day we saw a huge black figure go flying by in the window and look outside, once again to see nothing. We were both pretty spooked. Then a few years later, we were in the basement and when we looked away, the head of a doll moved slightly to the left. It was slow and progressively creepier because eventually it was facing my brother and I. We were both across the room. So this was the most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me. 
We even recorded it, but the camera was pretty garbage, and the battery died before it had fully swapped over to us. We both went into the other half of our basement, and when we went back, the doll was in its original position. We were both pretty traumatized, and that wasn't the last of it. The last major thing I remember was when we were in the living room together playing games. It was getting darker, but you could still see shadows from outside every once in a while. The bathroom door was wide open, and my brother and I saw the same thing. At first, we thought it was a shadow, but it wasn't transparent. Basically, there was a black figure in the bathroom, and when my brother walked over it, it darted away. Even though now I don't believe in paranormal stuff, I often question these events, and wonder if maybe I should. I used to own many dolls and stuffed animals, as most seven-year-olds would. I believed in magic, and had a huge fantasy. I even believed my dolls could move and do stuff when I wasn't watching, like in Toy Story. I always wanted to see my dolls move, but unfortunately never saw it. One day, my mother gave me a bowl of mashed potatoes and a glass of water. I went upstairs to my room and decided to have a nice meal with my dolls. I got some plastic bowls and spoons and put mashed potatoes in their bowls. I was hoping they would actually eat it. I had this one old-fashioned doll my grandma gave me, called Mary. I put the spoonful of mashed potatoes in her mouth and waited for her to eat it. Of course, nothing happened. After a few minutes, I wanted to go to the toilet, and before I left, I looked at my dolls and said, when I get back, I want all the bowls to be empty, in a strict tone. So I did my thing, went back upstairs, since we only had one toilet which was downstairs, and when I got back to the seat, the bowls were unfortunately still full which meant the dolls hadn't eaten a thing. But when I looked at Mary's bowl, it was empty. I was kind of shocked. I looked at Mary and her mouth was dirty, as if she had been eating it in a messy way. I rushed downstairs to my sister and mother and asked them if they had fed the doll, because the bowl was empty. They both said no and swore on their lives. Maybe your mashed potatoes fed it to the doll, one of them said. But since I believed in magic, I was just happy about it. This wasn't the last time I saw Mary acting unusual. One time I put her on my bed before I went on vacation to Morocco. And after six weeks, when I arrived back to the Netherlands, I saw that Mary wasn't sitting on my bed anymore. Instead, she was sitting on my trash can and her body faced the wall. But her head was turned 90 degrees so that her head was facing me. My mother said, you must have put her there before we left and you just forgot. That was weird. It wasn't the last time she did anything unusual. In sixth grade, I went camping with my class and took Mary with me. We made a huge fire while we were eating marshmallows. I took my doll out the bag and threw her in the fire. Everyone was confused, so I explained the paranormal experiences I had with Mary. And even though people didn't believe me and thought I was crazy, I was glad to be rid of her. And I'm glad I haven't seen her since that day. After my grandparents died, me and my girlfriend, now wife, moved into their house. We were doing the house up to sell, and multiple things happened to us over the two years we lived there. It started with the TV. It used to switch itself on nearly every night around 2am, and would just be static, but very loud. We used to go downstairs and switch it off, and still have the same TV. It's never done it since we left that house, and that was five years ago. One time my girlfriend was sat on the couch, and could feel someone stroking her back. On another occasion, my girlfriend was hoovering at the top of the stairs, and someone pushed her, but she grabbed the handrail and stopped herself from falling down the stairs. We also used to hear footsteps all the time coming up and down those stairs. There was another occasion where I was cooking, and the oven was by the window of the conservatory, 
so I could see inside. The door to the conservatory was on the right hand side of the cooker with frosted windows. My girlfriend is chatting to me. And as I'm cooking, she freaks out and says, someone just walked past the door. I see through the window and just laugh at her. But she was adamant someone walked past. So I open the door and switch the light on and there's nothing there. Later that night, I'm locking up to go to bed in the conservatory. The cat follows. I check the back door and it's locked. I go to switch off the light and I stop before I do. The cat's freaking out, hissing, and she runs out of the conservatory freaked out. The light blows, shatters everywhere, and it's dark. Then something barges me in the shoulder, and I get knocked back and hit my back hard into the wall. Then I'm at the door of the living room. I don't know how I got there. My girlfriend is sitting down looking at me. Are you okay? You've gone white. Apparently I'd ran into the living room and stopped at the door, but I've no recollection of this. I told her what happened and she said, I told you I saw something. I went into the conservatory, cleaned up, and nothing has happened since. My shoulder and back were hurting for a good week though. I told my mum what happened, as she grew up in that house, and told me multiple stories of things that she used to see, hear, and feel in that house. Yet no one else did in the family of seven that lived there. Just my mum, me, and my girlfriend. Then my mum told me what used to happen when I was two or three in the first house I lived in. It was worse than this. Yet, I have no memory of it. Back in the summer of 2012, I was in my high school, and then over the summer break, I had become absolutely obsessed with this show called The Supernatural. The story of two brothers, Sam and Dean Winchester, hunting monsters and demons. It was my absolute favorite. I've always had a knack for digging deep into the paranormal world, a little too interested about the other side, and watching the show only piqued my interest in this. I do not know how many of you hearing this have actually watched it, and even if you haven't, I'll give you a little context regarding the next part of my story. So in the initial seasons, they used to show exorcisms and various rituals, chanting spells and all that jazz. Watching those really intrigued me, so I wanted to look into this a little more and see for myself if the spells and such were real. I had the power of the internet at my disposal, and so one day in the middle of the night, I hopped onto Google and started typing keywords like demon, spell, witchcraft, etc. After pursuing through the contents of various sites, I was getting tired when I finally came across this one. Oh, I wish I could remember the name. The site had the most amazing spells, white magic to dark, summoning fairies to demons, it had it all. Being young and naive, I chanted the spells out loud I started with fairies and moved on to demons. Yes, just a tiny detail. All these spells required a few ingredients or had to be performed a specific day under the moon or in the forest or whatever. I didn't follow any of these rules and went straight for the spells. The spells were long and I have the attention span of a hummingbird. So I read them out loud for only half the spell. And by the time I was done, it was pretty late, so I crashed on my bed and fell asleep. I woke up the next morning with backaches, probably from sitting in front of the computer for too long, with three long nail marks on one of my thighs. It was red and sore. I immediately checked my own nails to rationalize the situation and saw my nails had not grown since the last time I had them trimmed, and I sleep alone. This was the first incident, which I brushed off. For that time, I went about with my day. Until later that night, I hopped on the computer and began going through those spells again. But tonight something happened. I couldn't sleep the entire night. I kept waking up in the middle of the night and thought I had a sinking feeling 
that I was being watched in my sleep, or that there was someone standing near my bed. I could properly get some sleep when the sunlight creaked through the gaps of my windows when I finally woke. And what I encountered made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. There were three more marks this morning, long deep ones, three on my other thigh and three on my left arm. Now I was scared. I had watched enough horror films and TV series to know what was happening. I concluded that I was being haunted by some kind of evil entity. Why the marks otherwise? I guess I was reading out the spells and I had done it too diligently and actually summoned a demon. I told my parents what was happening and at first they didn't believe me. Then I showed them the marks and they tried to somehow rationalize it with me. I kept trying to convince them and this night I didn't dare open my computer and again had more restless sleep, waking up often with the feeling of being watched and again the next morning. You guessed it, more red marks now on my right arm and a few on my back. Even though I had stopped going on the site and this ordeal continued for a few weeks before suddenly out of the blue it stopped. I realized this because I could finally sleep peacefully again and there were no new marks. Over the years I've shared this story to many people and no one could give me a proper answer as to why it happened or what it was. If you have any theories, I'd be grateful to hear them. I've had plenty of weird and unexplainable experiences, but this one is the only one that I find difficult putting into words. When I was around six, I remember whenever I found myself alone, I used to see a man in my house always behind me, in corners behind the sofa I was sitting on. This happened for years. This thing was very human like. There was not a faded or blurred line. And this thing would always be wearing the same clothes when I saw it. I would catch glimpses of it. And as soon as I turned around, it would be gone as if nothing were there. I remember as a child, it didn't scare me as much as it should have but I was always super cautious and uneasy. It never made me run crying to my parents though. What is weird is that at this time I recognized the man. In my head, the man was my uncle slash family friend who I thought was very much alive. So everything I saw, I put down to my imagination. A few years go by and I kept on seeing this. What I realized was that I never saw this man in real life. There were no pictures of him, never any meeting with families. So how could I possibly have this feeling that I knew him? How could my brain invent this character and backstory for him? I was asking around for this unidentified uncle and it seems he never really existed. I looked at the family photos of the family who I thought were his and nothing. Unfortunately, my father passed a few years ago, and since I've been trying to find photos of him, I came across a photo of my dad and his dad, my grandfather, who I'd never met. And the man I used to see looks a lot like him, but not an 100% match. My memories have obviously faded because of how long ago it was, but I know it's only in resemblance and not who I used to see as a child. When I was 16, I found a yellow sheer fabric. I think it was tapestry with outline of white fishes on it in my parents' attic. It was summer. My room tends to get hot. So I ended up using it as a blanket of sorts. My parents have no recollection of it or why it was in our home. I remember one night as I was trying to look for it and it seemed like it had vanished. I didn't really think much of it. I thought maybe my mum misplaced it when she washed it. I guess a few months passed and I remembered and wondered what had happened to it. My dad turns out burnt it. He said that one night he went to check on me and my sister 
as we shared a room and slept in separate twin beds. He told me that when he looked at my bed, it seemed like no one was sleeping there. He got closer as he was worried, and I was there. He said the more he got closer, he noticed it looked like I was wrapped with pitch black darkness, which really freaked him out, because my bed was against two big windows, and I purposely had really sheer curtains so that the moonlight and sun would brighten my room. But somehow, with the moonlight shining, I remained to look like darkness. My dad removed the blanket off me to make sure I wasn't passed out under it. He said he later looked at the blanket to see why the hell a sheer yellow blanket would do that. He said the white fishes didn't look like fishes at all. He described it as looking like the skeleton of fishes with something inside the bellies trying to get out. That's when he decided to burn it. Honestly, I don't know what to think to this day. I never felt anything wrong with the blanket itself. I really think my dad was just being dad, as he's a man of faith. And around that time, he was listening to a sermon of objects being able to retain spirits. Matthew 8, 24 to 34 is what I remember him bringing up. I'm just wondering if anyone might have experienced anything like this. I'm not sure if the blanket was cursed, but whatever my dad thought, it was enough to burn the damn thing. Then again, my dad can be very extreme when it comes to things. I'd just like to know someone else's thoughts. Some years ago, the organization I work for had a printing department, which had a warehouse slash distribution office that was situated several miles from the main office. We had a crew of about a dozen people working there. There was a rumor going around that this building was haunted. At first, I didn't believe the rumors. Then slowly, stories got out from staff members who worked at the office. They said they often heard the sound of children running around the warehouse at night, but it would be completely empty when they went to check. Some claimed that they would see and hear furniture being moved when they worked at night. Later, their disturbance grew more insistent, with people being touched by unseen hands, things going missing and turning up at random places. One person claimed that she was pressed against the wall by something invisible and big. It all came to a head when someone got badly hurt. A colleague was clearing a few late deliveries late one evening before clocking out. He was at the main office on the second floor. When he was done, he locked the office up and headed downstairs to clock out. As he was in the landing at the top of the stairs, he said something pushed him hard. He flew down the top stairs, then rolled down the other half of the staircase. His screams brought security guards running. They found him at the bottom in a pool of blood. The ambulance and paramedics were called. My colleague and friend was in bad shape. He had a cracked skull, a broken arm, a broken leg, a massive concussion, and was bleeding from his head. He was unconscious. They carefully got him into the ambulance and took him into the emergency room. He did not regain consciousness for a few more days. It was scary because the doctors weren't sure if he would have brain damage until they could assess his responses. When he woke up, he told us what happened. He said something had pushed him. They checked the CCTV and saw him go down the stairs then suddenly flew forwards down the stairs. An investigation was done, but they found nothing that could prove that he tripped. Eventually, he got better, and he never went to work on the stairs alone again. Stories of minor disturbances continued until we sold off the building. It's still standing. Now it's the headquarters of some charity organization. The video still exists. According to the security guy, they keep it under lock and key, along with several other videos that show weird things happening in the building. Perhaps someday, I'll be able to get my hands on them. 
I too feature in a few of them. But those are less exciting stories. My very young daughter started telling us that she would see a lady in our house six months ago, about the time she started to be able to communicate well. She said there was an older lady who she described as always wearing brown. We call her the lady. I showed my daughter pictures of her great grandparents on both sides, thinking it was just a deceased family member. But she never recognized anyone. We started noticing sounds like doors creaking, rustling sounds and things dropping, cabinet doors creaking. But everything we heard we thought could be potentially explainable. We started hearing things more frequently about five weeks ago. I saw a cabinet door in our bathroom swing open while I was brushing my teeth in the reflection of the mirror behind me. Again, super strange but perhaps somehow potentially explainable. Two days later, we had a massive water leak behind that same mirror. Due to the water leak, all of our belongings had to have been moved out of our house for the contractors to repair the damage. I've been cleaning and boxing stuff up. And I was boxing up one item in our room when I found two old photographs around the 1880s. As soon as I pulled them out, my daughter said, that's the lady. I asked her which and she pointed to the younger of the two women. We asked her three times throughout the day about the photographs. And each time she picked out the same lady. We also noticed the lady in the photo appeared to be wearing brown because of the type of photography. So we took the photographs out and moved them to my new art studio which is on our property and still in progress. Since removing the old photographs, we have not heard one strange noise in our house. My oldest daughter never makes it through the night in her bed. She has complained since she was a little girl of moving shadows in her room at night. She has since slept every night in her room all night since the photographs have been removed. The daughter who sees the lady usually sees her once every week to two weeks. So we can't comment about that. Completely surprised by the drastic change in our house, I decided to use a dream slash sleep recording app that only records when it hears sounds to see if I could catch something near the photographs in the studio. I mainly want to prove or disprove it to myself. I recorded Thursday afternoon for three hours and had seven audio clips of birds and planes. I tried again Thursday night from 12 to 8am. And this time I had 67 clips. Most of the clips were this weird reverb slash electrical feedback that started at after midnight and went on and off for hours. I also heard what sounded like two separate single knocks or objects dropping. There was nothing electrical in the studio except the phone itself as power has not been running in the building yet. There isn't even a breaker box. There's a power pole outside the building about 20 feet away from the front. And last night we left the recorder on from 1130 to 7am. Not one weird electrical sound all night. We literally caught crickets and one clip with two small bumps or knocks followed by rustling. We also caught a strange sound at the end of some clip. We don't remember how we came into possession of the photographs. They are not of our family. We confirmed this with our parents. My husband thinks he remembers that one of my customers gave them to me a few years ago. The year of 2013. I moved into one of the four houses that came from Stephenson Island in the late 1800s. A lot of loggers had died on that island. Well, I was supposed to get the basement for my room. As soon as I stepped into that house, an eerie presence hit me. I felt uneasy. The feeling grew worse descending into that basement. The crawl space was boarded off. I was a very depressed teenager, cutting, 
debating ending it all, you know, the fun stuff. What I didn't know was something was feeding off it. My room at night had an eerie feeling. I kept the lights completely off and immediately went to sleep after this, because you would see figures of people in the room standing over you and watching you intently. At this time, I believe they were merely curious about my family's presence in the house. Basically them wondering what we were doing at their place. So skip forward half a year later. Weird occurrences start happening. I lost my sketchbook, and my sketchbook is my baby, and I would never lose that. I also had shavers being thrown at me in the shower. My brother and I were sitting on the couch playing video games during the end of winter and heard metal scraping across the attic floor above us. Now I know that sound. It wasn't just any metal, it was a metal chair scraping across a wooden floor. I tell my brother and he doesn't want to believe it. Fast forward a few more months, I finally find my sketchbook in the weirdest place. Because for one, I'm always in my room because my depression is eating me alive. And two, I would never place my sketchbook so perfectly in front of the door. I came home, opened my door and there the thing was in front of the door perfectly in the middle. I felt weird but shrugged it off. A week later, my brother left his bowl of mac and cheese in the kitchen. He came back and watched it stop moving towards the edge of the counter. He doesn't believe in this type of stuff, but even he can't explain that. I started becoming more of a positive and happy person and then moved out into the living room to sleep because my mother and father cannot sleep in the same bed anymore comfortably due to her sickness. So my dad took the room. I took the living room and the first night I was petrified. Yes, my brother slept on the other couch, but I was scared, very scared. I had a direct view into the kitchen where the basement was, and if I tried looking another way, I'd see into the bathroom. So I thought, let's just look in the bathroom instead. Wrong. I was so wrong it was almost bad. You could see figures going back and forth, and I ended up shutting the door like the chicken that I am. But then bam, I wanted to take pictures because it calms me down. I happened to be using Snapchat. I didn't think anything of these pictures until people began messaging me, saying things like, what the hell is that? There's a demon thing standing in your kitchen. So personally, I felt scared. I went to bed that night only to be struck by sleep paralysis. I had sleep paralysis for a month non-stop. This is where things got really bad. I lay on my couch stuck, not being able to move, scream, and just look around frantically. This creature lifted me up and made me levitate, and opened my legs and started tugging at the hem of my skinny jeans, as I used to wear skinny jeans to bed, because I didn't have pyjamas, but I had skinny jeans. Another spirit intervened and threw the creature down. I, still in the air, finally get out of the sleep paralysis, fall and hit my head, got up and ran into my mother's room scared and crying. Imagine a 14 or 15 year old asking if they can sleep with you because of sleep paralysis. After that night, I started to not sleep as much. I didn't want to sleep after that, but I give in one night and regret that night. I awoke to my cat, my cat's bed being dragged away from me towards the basement. I had it. I'd had it with this thing. It could mess with me, but not my baby. I threatened to seal it away in the basement and attic if it didn't stop messing around with my family and our cats. It's one thing to mess with me, but my family and cats is something else. I told it I didn't want to seal it away but that we could live in harmony together. Luckily, it stopped everything besides the shadow creatures and occasionally hiding my shirt and throwing shavers at me. Ever since I moved out, my family 
has had very few problems with this entity. The shadow creatures will not leave my father alone. He recently told me he felt the same way about that room, and that if you ever open your eyes you can see a figure hovering over the bed. My brother leaves the bedroom door closed, so I'm sure he doesn't want to admit he's having issues with shadow creatures as well. My entire life I've lived in the same home. My grandfather built it in the 70s, and my mum remodeled it while she was pregnant with me. It's in Southern California in a slow and mellow beach community, founded in the 50s, so there's not a lot of paranormal stuff happening. The only peculiar thing while growing up was the man that whistled outside my bedroom window every night at exactly 7.43pm. I never thought anything of it, and by the time I was in middle school, I basically used it to keep time. The whistle itself sounds like a man calling to a dog. A short and happy sort of sound. He whistled the same sound every night, at the same time. He'd even stayed the same during daylight savings time. One night, my mum was in my room with me. Not a common occurrence, as she had her own problems and we didn't see each other often, even when I was younger. I heard the whistle and promptly got up to brush my teeth and wash my face like I did every night, and my mum reacted kind of odd. In retrospect, I can understand why. She was in the middle of saying something and I just walked out of the room. She followed me and asked why I was getting ready for bed this early. Great parenting, mum. And I just said, I heard the whistle. I'm not going to sleep yet, but it's time for me to get ready at least. I was young, and that's how my mum tells it. She has a terrible memory, but she said that that's the one thing that she can quote verbatim besides the Pledge of Allegiance because it was so unsettling. She hasn't heard any whistle. She didn't want to say anything, so she listened at the exact same time next night. She still heard nothing, but she saw me walk to the bedroom and get ready for bed. She didn't tell me until I was 14, so that I wouldn't be scared. Over time, I started to whistle with the man. I would imitate it perfectly, and I knew almost instinctively when to do it. It's like when you wake up to the same time alarm, so often you wouldn't sleep in even if you wanted to. I started to do this during my senior year, so I didn't really notice when the whistling got closer. I still don't know why for sure, but I think it was because that's when I seriously started thinking about colleges. During my senior year, there was some family drama, and I had to move back in with my father for a few months, and it seemed like something was missing, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. It wasn't the whistling itself, but the feeling of being watched that always accompanied it. I had gotten so used to it that I didn't realize how uneasy it really made me feel. After I turned 18, I moved back into the house alone. My mum got arrested, nothing crazy, don't worry, and she was gone for four months and wanted me to stay and watch the house. This whole thing put me off school, so I spent most of my time either working or focusing on getting my GED. This is when things got weird. I never thought of the man as a bad spirit in any sense. I had almost come to see him as a guardian angel. I made up a name for him, Gregory, and his dog was Socks. It was about January of this year, freshly 19, with a GED and big dreams of college, that I realized just how sinister things were. Only I could hear the whistle. The amount of sleepovers I had, where I was the one getting ready for bed too early definitely proves it. It was only outside my window. If I were at any other spot in the house, I wouldn't hear it. It had slowly moved closer to the window over the years as well. I used to be on the street, before I realized it had crossed the grassy slope from the sidewalk to the brick foundation that my house sat on. The night I applied for my new college, I got in, and I'm transferring in next fall, I heard a tap, 
I've got some crappy friends and thick blinds, so I went over and swung them open fast to spook whatever arsehat tried to spook me, but I saw nothing. It was getting dark, and the sunset over the ocean was bright red. Unusual, but nothing alarmed me. But what I saw in the sunset definitely terrified me. There he was, his head cocked and just staring out from the outside wall besides my large front to ceiling window. Only for a moment. It was almost like when something flashes on a screen for a tenth of a second, and you kind of remember it, but you didn't have enough time to really process it. The face was pale, and his eyes were thin with age, but still intense. He had no facial hair. His eyebrows were thick and wiry. And when I blinked, I saw him like a brand on the back of my lids. I was shaken. The encounter felt like a warning. Why, on God's green earth, would the man that has been alongside me for so long try to hurt me? I almost felt betrayed. He had become the one constant, but now when I look back on what I perceived to be a comforting caregiver, I am only met with an uneasy stomach and the beginnings of a headache. This was just the beginning. Every night he tapped on my window, and every night I jumped. I was still living alone, and didn't want to call anyone about it. I was crazy. Absolutely batshit bonkers, and I knew it. I felt isolated and alone, unable to go anywhere, but the place I feared most. My friends had either moved away for college, or were staying with their parents, so I couldn't ask them for help or my family would lock me up. There's been a history of bipolar disorder in my family, and they shunned her for it. If it came forwards about talking about a ghost man that I named Gregory and his dog at my window, they'd laugh. It seems funny from an outsider's perspective, really. I started taking the graveyard shift, and doing night classes that cost me more than they were worth. I stopped having friends over because of course they were going to hang at my place, where there was never anyone to bother our hooligan asses. I was so lonely for about two months. I started having panic attacks when I would look outside at work to see the sun setting. One particular night, it was so bad that my boss called after my concerned co-worker contacted her, and said that I needed to go home. It was the last thing I wanted. But this fear was making me physically sick, so I decided to grow some balls and stand in front of my open window at 7.43 exactly. I stood there with chills up my back and waited. After moments of tense, staticky silence, I turned to look at the clock in confusion. It was 7.45. There was nothing. No whistling, no tapping, and definitely no face. I felt triumphant. I was almost cocky when I really did nothing. I felt like I had conquered Gregory and Sox. Just as I was coming down from Victory High, I heard what sounded like long nails on my hardwood floor. It almost sounded like my dogs, but I had put them in the backyard to do their business, and neither of them were big enough to make that almost galloping sound. I couldn't see anything with my eyes, but I felt the fear of an animal running towards me at full speed, the hesitation between a heartbeat. I had nowhere to run, but I knew I had to do something. I could feel the ominous and dreary presence of the man coming from just outside the door inside my hallway, and the threat of a feral dog I knew was in front of me but couldn't see. For a moment, everything went quiet again, and I almost forgot how to breathe. I felt the presence leave. I own you, Zoe. It was clear as day, and right in my ear. I could almost feel the breath rustle my hair. I broke down crying. I had never felt so helpless in my entire life. This thing that watched me grow and go through crappy puberty years and breakups and terrible family drama knew everything about me. I had let this dead man dictate my life for so long. He got into my head. I rented a shitty motel room for the next few weeks with my pups. I didn't recommend putting two dwarf pit bulls in a hotel room. 
and when I finally came back, the whistling was back on the street, accompanied by the sound of paws on concrete. This story terrifies me to my core. I'm in the city that I'll call home for a few more months to meet with my leasing agent. But right now, I'm going home tomorrow, and can feel that familiar sensation of what I can only describe as heartbreak and a loss of control seep back in. I don't want to go back. I found this place to share this story, and it felt like one of the few places I could ask my advice. I tried sage, and even had my deep Christian friend come over and say prayers at my doorway. I guess that's a thing. I don't know. Please, I need help. This isn't a lie, and it's not a story. I am terrified to go home to that empty house. But I'm saving for an apartment and travel expenses and tuition, so I can't go to a motel. I really and genuinely don't know what to do. Anything will be helpful. I'm moving in January, but Gregory got so close to me, and I have heard that in order to hear something that clearly is from the dead, means that he is strong. My boyfriend's grandfather is an antique collector, and one of his interests are dolls, porcelain to be exact. They picked this up, and the previous owner said to be very careful with it, because it was special. Completely unfazed by this statement, he didn't ask any further questions. He brought it home with him about two weeks ago. The first three days were fine, and it stayed in the kitchen. The following day, my boyfriend and I were laying in our room down the hall, talking. It was around midnight when suddenly three light knocks were heard through the door. We look at each other, and from the other side I hear his grandfather say his name. I get up and open the door while he was getting ready for whatever task his grandfather had in store for him. Upon opening the door, I expected to be brought face to face with him, but no one was there. I close the door and shrug it off, but after I close the door, I could hear footsteps from down the hall, so I go out to investigate. But in the distance, I can hear both the grandparents snoring. The following day, around the same time, all power to the house was lost, and didn't return till 5 or 6 am. Thankfully, throughout that night, one lamp was on. I don't know how, but occasionally it went out, but for the most part, somehow, it was still being powered. A few more nights go by without anything happening, until just a few nights ago. All through the night there were screams, not in the house but right outside. Last night, at around 2 to 3 am, I was laying down watching videos when my boyfriend sat straight up, rambled gibberish mixed with numbers. I asked him what was wrong, and he said he was okay looked me dead in the eyes, screamed and threw himself back, and continued snoring. I asked him about it earlier today, and he has no memory of it. His grandfather is taking the doll to his shop tomorrow, and hopefully, things will go back to normal. After he took it out the house and put it in his antique shop, the air seemed heavy, and everyone is easily irritated. Usually the family is upbeat, kind of an I can conquer anything kind of attitude. I've also had a few hyper realistic dreams, one where I was drowning, another where I was burned alive, and another where I was pulled apart, and another one where I was captured and shown my new face as I didn't have one. There was a tall man there that said, look at the beauty I have created, unnerving to say the least. Last night, I went to go spend the night at my girlfriend's apartment. I got to her apartment around 12.30am, and locked the doors and turned all the lights off, because she was already asleep in her room. I laid down and fell asleep with her almost immediately. 
around 1.30 a.m., we were both kind of half conscious because she had switched sleeping positions and kissed me. And not even a minute or two later, we were both simultaneously woken up by a loud ass voice that came from the open door of her room. That was a deep male voice saying, fool. That's all I can remember because my adrenaline kicked in and I was ready to fight if someone was in the apartment with us. Neither of us can remember exactly what was said, aside from it being super loud. Honestly, I was scared and there was someone in the apartment with us. I immediately threw my hand over my girlfriend's mouth because she was freaking out about the scream because I knew she thought there was someone in the apartment with us as well. I looked at her and motioned for her to be quiet. As I got up and turned all the lights on and searched the entire apartment, there was nothing. All of the doors were still locked and I checked everywhere any person could hide and found nothing. I tried to lay out all the facts after this happened, but I've concluded that it had to have been some sort of entity. Other facts that I've paid attention to while trying to debunk this, you can hear the neighbors throughout the entire building, but only while they're screaming or stomping around. And even then it's always muffled because it's coming through the floral walls. So it couldn't have been that because of how loud this voice was. So it eliminates that possibility. The window was open in her room because it was hot in her room. And I've even looked outside and there were zero footprints around the window. We live in Upper Michigan's Upper Peninsula, and we have a lot of snow. This eliminates that factor. My girlfriend's dog was sleeping between my legs when we heard this voice, and she was dead asleep when I got up to check what the hell it was. So that eliminates the possibility of it being the dog. We've both been pretty bewildered by this encounter. I spent the night there again recently, and found that her closet door, which we had confirmed had been closed before we went to sleep, was found wide open. This was only due to what I encountered seconds before, which was feeling someone's hand on my pillow next to my face. I could feel the pressure it made, and it made me wake up. I looked at the pillow, and there was an imprint of what appeared to be a large hand, when I was observing the pillow, I had noticed the closet door was wide open and my girlfriend's dog was laying on the floor staring at it. I don't know what it means, but I know something is going on and I need to get to the bottom of it. My grandmother on my mother's side was always considered to be our family's crazy one. Long before I was born, the marriage to my mother's father had failed because my grandmother was far too interested in witchcraft. My grandmother really liked astrology. This was considered witchcraft to my grandfather's very Catholic family. Growing up, she used to tell me stories about the fairies that lived in her garden and how I should never leave my shoes outside at night for the gnomes may steal them. As any child of the 90s, I was in love with Disney. So all of grandma's stories seemed to be just that, stories. There were always rules to being at grandma's house, most certainly not your typical ones. Things like leave the windows open at night so the frogs can come in and be sure not to step on any of the frogs. If you bake something, you must leave a small piece for the fairies or things will start to go missing. Odd rules, but as a kid, it was fun. Now my grandmother was a hoarder for my entire life. The type who has a trail from one end of the house to the other. Everything else was stacked floor to ceiling. She never hoarded trash. It was always useful things, just things she was probably never going to use herself that needed to have just in case. And food. Oh Lord, did that woman hoard food. My grandmother grew up during the Great Depression, 
constantly having to move around and leave everything she owned behind each time. Once she grew up and was able to create her own stability, she started hoarding. My mother says my grandmother started hoarding when my mother was a teen, and never stopped. Most of the things she would collect came from goodwills, flea markets, garage sales, and pretty much unwanted secondhand crap. Something else I feel as though I should mention. I am the youngest child of three. My two older siblings are my half siblings. My sister and I share the same father and brother and I share the same mother. My brother was around four or five when my parents met, meaning I wasn't the first grandchild my grandma had, but I was the only one she seemed to like. My siblings were never invited to her house or really welcome to be there at all. My grandmother treated my siblings as though they didn't exist. Me on the other hand, she would call my parents constantly to ask when we were going to be in the valley next, and if they would like to bring me to her house to spend the weekend. Neither of my other siblings ever stayed the night at grandma's house. I feel as though the above information is important as to why I'm making this post. I was 13 at the time I brought him home. I had spent a weekend with that grandmother while my parents were staying at another relative's house not far from there. This was pretty normal, as stated before. I seemed to be the only family member she liked. Well, that weekend my grandmother gave me a music box slash porcelain doll. I collected porcelain dolls, so I didn't think anything of it. The fact that she was giving me a new one. She told me to take care of him, that he's very special, and I needed to be sure to give him the love and attention he deserves. I was instructed to wind and play him at least once a month. Okay, whatever you say, Grandma. My mother and her ended up having a falling out, and I was told that if I wanted to see her or speak to her, I would have to find my own way of doing so. But as far as my mother was concerned, she was dead to our family. Still to this day, I have no idea what their falling out was over. Now there's a whole lot to be covered between the time period of 13 to 18. The strangest of them all was at 15, I had to have an emergency neck surgery. A mass had appeared and started cutting off blood flow to my brain. If I hadn't have gone to the hospital for my neck being sore, I could certainly have died. Fast forward to Mother's Day 2011. I'm 18 at the time. Every four years or so, my grandmother's birthday would fall on Mother's Day, and did so on that day. I hadn't talked to her for a few years at that point, since I wasn't allowed to use the house phone to contact her, and for the longest time, no one would give me her phone number. So I got her number and called her, and the conversation went like this. Hey grandma, it's me. I just wanted to call you to wish you a happy birthday and Mother's Day. Do you have anything special going on? Oh goodness, I thought I'd never get to speak to you again. I'm surprised that bitch mother of yours let you call me. Yeah, I'm sorry I haven't called sooner, but I've really missed you, Grandma. How would you feel about me making a trip up there to see you soon? Oh, that would be wonderful. We can finally talk about all the things your mother has been hiding from you. She's been lying to you your whole life about who you really are. Don't deny it. Embrace it. You need to confront your mother and demand she tell you what she's been keeping from you. Oh. Okay, Gran. So, what do you think of me coming to see you soon? I'd really like to catch up with you. I've missed you so much. Do you think you'd come to my high school graduation next month? <gasps> yes, you should definitely come see me. Can you come this next weekend? No, I don't think I can, but I'll try. After a very long silence. Do you still have him? Who? The jester? Uh, yeah, I do. Why? Bring him with you. Oh, all right, Grandma. Well, I'll have to go soon because I'm making dinner tonight. But I love you, and I'll call you again soon. I attempted to call her again a few weeks later to see if she could attend my graduation. 
She didn't answer. My other phone calls over the next few months were unanswered as well. She died that December. Which brings me to my whole point of this post. The doll she gave me I've had for 10 years now. I've had a lot of unexplainable experiences I'd prefer to keep private, but I'd be willing to share those more on a one-to-one -one basis if they could possibly help. But as far as the noticeable activity that I and my partner witnessed are as follows. Night terrors start. If it's not in our bedroom or sleeping space, like the absolute worst I've ever had. Things go missing and turn up in places they should not have been in. It will go through months of sitting alone on a shelf, not being wound or played, but will constantly play single notes or small parts of the song. And then there's our new dog. He can't stand it. He will wake up from a dead sleep and start blinking and growling like crazy at it. I have a video of him doing so. I have depression and think back to when I first started to feel the way I do. It was around the time the doll came into my life. I guess what I'm getting at is I need help, figuring out if there really is something going on or if I'm just crazy. Help to bring him and myself to peace again. There's a whole lot that I wanted to say but haven't been able to, and would be more than willing to talk to someone if they think they can help. And please, don't recommend Sage. You don't think I've tried that? My mother and stepfather bought a house in a 70s era suburb in the late 90s. I was about 13 at the time and already having a lot of issues with depression. Typical teenager stuff. Things were tense between my older brother and my stepdad and I wasn't having the best time with parents in general either. So we move into this house. It seemed fine. I had already had some unexplained experiences prior to this and other houses we lived in for as far back as I can remember. And I was looking forward to perhaps not having to deal with that again. Oh man, it did not go down like that. The first thing I remember was one night around five or six, my parents hadn't come home from work yet. It was dark out already, being winter in Canada, and I was sitting in the living room on the main floor and started hearing muffled voices talking. It sounded like an old man and a little girl having a conversation. I could hear the gravelly tone of his voice and the high-pitched sing-song quality of hers. But as usual in these stories, I couldn't tell what exactly they were saying. I walked to the basement stairs and leaned over the railing to see what was going on. Where was it coming from? It was definitely from down there, where the dark, creepy laundry and storage room was. Hello? I yelled down. The voices ceased immediately. Good enough. I had no interest to investigate. It happened a few more times, only when I was alone at night. This didn't really scare me. It could be worse, right? So yeah, it got worse. As my mental health started slipping further into depression land, my experiences became interesting. More than once, I would hear extremely loud pounding in the laundry room. It sounded like someone was throwing haymakers at the washing machine, trying to punch a hole through it. Just that hollow, metallic bang, 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 over and over again. The first time it happened, it scared the cap out of me. I'm not easily startled, but it was so loud and so intense that I had to go check. The terrific pounding didn't stop until I made it down the basement stairs and stood in the doorway of the laundry room. Then it stopped immediately. I turned on the light, checked the laundry machine, and they were empty and not running. I even called my mum to ask about it. She said no one was doing laundry and it was probably nothing. The second time it happened, again I was alone. I ran down to check. This time, I was gonna figure it out. Nope. Same story. It stopped as soon as I got to the door. The sound was violent and extremely loud, 
and I was not impressed. So I told it to shut the hell up and went back upstairs. It didn't happen again after that. So awesome. I sure told it, right? No, I was talking on the cordless phone to one of my friends. We had been chatting for about a half hour when all of a sudden this loud static noise cuts off the conversation and a guttural voice sounded like it was gargling and talking unintelligibly for about 10 seconds with loud static accompanying the whole time. Then it cut out and I was back with my friend. She immediately asked, what the hell was that? And I nearly crapped myself. I didn't think she would hear it on her end, but she absolutely did and described it to me before I said anything to her. So that's cool. Right on. No biggie. One night she came over to sleep because my parents were out of town and because of my crippling depression, they didn't trust me by myself. So they greenlit her for staying over. Everything was normal until next morning. She slept on the couch in the living room and I slept in my bed. I got up to go to the bathroom when I woke up that morning. When I finished and came out, I went into my room to change. On my dresser, one of my candles was lit. My friend was still sleeping on the couch and she was not the type to play pranks. I wasn't scared about ghosts at that point. I was just pissed that something started a fire. That's just dangerous. And no one would believe me if I said I didn't do it. So I was miffed. I told whatever it was that it can't be starting fires, house rules, and it never happened again. Many times I would be laying in bed at night, staring into the dark, not able to sleep. The dark plays tricks, I know this, but this was still a little weird to me. I heard shuffling in my closet, like someone was going through a box of my stuff. The closet door was open and I was looking in. It was dark, but I could see something on the top shelf moving. I turn on the light and there's nothing. This occurrence kept happening at least once every week. I once woke up in the middle of the night freezing. My blankets were down by my feet, which in itself isn't that unusual. So I just grab and pull it up, but it didn't work. I yanked hard on them and it felt like the blanket was caught perhaps. I use all my strength to pull the goddamn blanket and it wouldn't budge. At that point, I got scared and decided to go back to sleep without the blanket. I didn't open my eyes during the entire ordeal and I didn't want to. After that night, I felt my blanket slowly being pulled off me a few times and I snatched it right back as soon as it started. Not today, asshole. So many times in the night, I would wake up startled and see someone standing at the end of my bed. Whoever it was had long hair, I assume, as the head, neck and shoulders weren't defined, but it sure was male. He was huge, six foot four and beefy. I could only ever see the silhouette, but it was always the same one. Once I watched it rise like it was coming out of the floor. That was interesting. I just rolled over and closed my eyes. Whatever, dude, creep away, I'm tired. It wasn't just the house either. It felt like it was the entire neighborhood that was a little touched. I'd go on walks at night to stabilize myself and keep myself out of trouble, but also to smoke weed and cigarettes or drink. So I'm walking down a cement path that goes behind people's houses, like a dog walking path. People's back gates would open onto this path and you can walk all over the neighborhood without really hitting any streets. It was like a back path maze. About two houses down from mine, these people had a wooden gate and a set of about three stairs to go into the yard. I'd sit on those stairs a lot and just smoke and chill, trying to center myself mentally. One night, I was going to sit on them as normal and I got close enough to see. It looked like there was a two year old sitting on the stairs. I got weirded out because what the hell is a kid at that age doing alone outside at this time of night? I got closer 
and noticed that this kid didn't have a friggin' head. I could see him sitting there, his hands on his lap, overall striped shirt, and nothing above his neck. He was solid like a real person, and I could see the neck meet where it looked like his head was severed. No blood though, so I kept walking. There were parks within stumbling distance of my house that all connected to each other. The first park had a playground, the next one it connected to had an elementary school, and the third was just trees and grass. So I'm walking home at 11pm, snow on the ground at minus 20 Celsius, low clouds, so the light of the city reflected back and illuminated everything better than a full moon ever could. It was damn near daylight out there, and I could see from one end of the park to the other. At the furthest end, I saw a black form moving quickly. I figured it was a cat or rabbit or something, and then a second, and then a third. I started getting worried it was coyotes. They moved fast and were definitely running. They crossed back and forth and began heading in my direction. They crossed over each other as they got closer. And over the span of about 10 seconds, they had gotten about halfway to me. Then they disappeared. At first, I thought maybe they dove under some new snow, or something like that. But the entire time I didn't hear a sound, no paw on crunchy snow, no animal calls, nothing. After that, I started getting a really bad feeling any time I even looked into the park from the street. Fast forward to when I was 23, and had to move back there after screwing up my life. I ended up having to stay in the bedroom in the basement, as they had converted my old room into a study. I'm sitting at my desk reading, when I hear something rustling in my closet. Ah, memories. It seriously sounded like there was a raccoon tossing things looking for food. So I get up and turn on the light. The noise persists, which confused me, as I'm used to things stopping when I take notice. So I go into the closet and start hauling everything out, convinced I was going to find a mouse or something. The entire time I searched that closet, these noises continued, and after hauling the last thing out and scouring for signs of poop or holes, the noises finally stopped. I have many other stories about places I've lived in, but these have been some of the more intense. I was raised Catholic, and became an atheist around when I started middle school. I did not come out to my parents about being an atheist, until I was well into college, so I spent my teenage years pretending to be Catholic. Several times when I was a kid, I would get a bad premonition feeling in the middle of the night that were basically panic attacks. I was certain that I was going to die, or that something bad was about to happen. When I told my mum about these, she would encourage me to pray until the feeling went away. So one night in high school, I wake up with this feeling again. I feel like there's something watching me even though my bedroom is well lit by a nearby streetlight, and there's nothing there. Whenever I hear someone say that they felt a presence, I think of this moment. My senses give me no indication that there was anyone around, but I was certain that there was, despite all evidence to the contrary. I thought that they must be darting in and out of my vision faster than I could blink or that they had managed to get under my bed somehow without opening the closed and locked window and door to my room. After laying in bed, panicked for what felt like hours, my sister calls out to me from her room across the hall. She had heard a voice and thought slash hoped it was me, but it wasn't. I lied and said it was so that she wouldn't be scared. We both got out of bed and went to get my mother. She saw the look on my face and got out her Bible and sat us all down in the living room. I panicked even more because I had no faith in what she was about to do would be helpful. 
I don't know where I heard it. But I remember someone once saying something about there being loads of people who didn't believe in God, but they believe in the devil. I didn't believe that my mum's praying was going to help, but I did believe that whatever I was feeling was evil with a capital E. My sister, who was a year younger than me, started to cry after our second our father. She was, and still is, fiercely religious. And this was the first time that she had ever experienced the middle of the night dread the way that I had when I was a kid. Even though I didn't believe the words, I said them anyway. Now that I'm in graduate school to be a mental health counsellor, I can in retrospect say that repeating a mantra of familiar words that were once comforting and reassuring would naturally help calm someone in my state. However, I didn't feel calmer as we continued to pray. I only felt increasingly anxious that something awful was about to happen. I noticed my mother getting louder and louder with every word, and I couldn't tell if she was angry, scared, or both. I followed suit and became louder, but the presence didn't go away. Without any warning, there was a loud bang, like a gunshot and the floor shook as though it had happened right next to us. I distinctly remember facing the heavy glass door to the patio and seeing it vibrate. We were all stunned into silence. As a kid, nothing was scarier than seeing my parents scared and the look of wide-eyed terror on my mother's face at that moment is burned into my brain. Pretty much immediately, the panic I felt subsided. My mother stood up and walked into the patio door to look outside. Then she looked at the clock. It was 3 a.m. My father slept throughout all of this, without even stirring, and could not believe that the house shook so much without waking him. To this day, my mother is positive that we banished a demonic presence from the house. I myself have no idea what happened. But I know that I felt in my heart that I was doomed, and I felt the house shake in a way that I still cannot explain away rationally. There is a ghost cat in my family. Surprisingly, we refer to it as ghost cat. It's an itty bitty just out of kittenhood tuxedo cat with a little extra white facial fur. It died around 1992 or so. I have a sister with a strong penchant for narcotics, and she was staying in the third floor loft at my mum's spindly old Victorian era home when she brought home this kitten. She had it for long enough for it to have discovered how to escape downstairs to the kitchen, where my mother noticed and would feed it. Then it suddenly stopped. Knowing my sister and fearing the worst, my mum went looking and found the poor little thing. It had gotten into the storage slash attic side of the third floor, went exploring under a loose floorboard, got trapped and sadly perished. I was home visiting at the time as I'd moved out of state and helped bury it. Apparently, we'd forgotten to tell it that it died because when I was home to visit the next year, it visited me. I'd gone to sleep in the spare room, making sure that mum's crazy sex crazed and somewhat vicious old intact tomcat Jack was not locked in with me. I climbed into bed, turned off the nightstand light and settled back to sleep. And a little something undeniably cat like jumps on the bed. Being a bit groggy and having cats of my own, it takes me a second for me to be concerned. But I'd woken up before with Jack, fastened to a leg by claw and teeth, going to town like a jackhammer. So I flipped the light on and hunted for him, intent to throw him out. No cat. Off with the light, back under the covers. Was mostly asleep when I felt a little thump of a small cat on the bed. I turn on the light, and there's nothing there. I mention it the next morning, and am told the little kit 
that I buried the previous year wasn't at rest. It supposedly would jump in bed with mum, play and chase back and forth with Jack, and occasionally be seen watching curiously over the household goings on. In other words, just being a cat. I didn't believe it much then, but over the years it stopped by when I came home to visit. When mum got ill enough to swallow her pride, cancer, I came home and couldn't deny there was a little spirited cat in the house. Well, I could. It's just always at the line, you know where it's deniable. When mum sadly passed, ghost cat roamed up and down the stairs loudly. It was the first time I saw the little thing, and it slept in my bed that night too. It shared space with my then girlfriend, now wife, and our cats after we took up residence there for about a year. And when we moved and started setting up mum's estate, I'd see it out of the corner of my eye as I did repairs or packed family memorabilia. I went back over not long ago, checking pipes against the cold, electricity off, so I was working with a flashlight. They were new owners, a nice couple expecting their first kid to take possession the following month. And just outside the flashlight beam was this little tuxedo kitty. Just vague enough that I couldn't swear I saw it, but enough that I knew it was there. So I told it while working. This wasn't its home anymore, and it should come home with me. It was about a week later, the night before last, that I felt an extra cat thump onto the bed. I think, maybe it's wishful thinking but I'm pretty sure Ghost Cat has moved with us now. I'm hoping, anyway. I am currently on vacation in Mexico. I have family here, my grandparents, four uncles and their family, and my family all live on the same street. We live on a ranch and the nearest airport is a four hour drive. When we arrive here, Uncle D picks us up. And on our way to our ranch, him and my dad were catching up. My uncle proceeds to tell him that currently they have been having some weird experiences with a doll. That the doll was haunting him and his family for a while. This included keeping them up all night by knocking on their windows and stuff. He also said that it was attacking people who were walking down the street late at night and that a guy even tried to shoot it. Everyone was fed up about it and tried to set up a group to attack it. I was creeped out, but thought that maybe he was lying or joking around. We arrived and for the first two days we slept at my aunt's house. This is because our house had recently been renovated. Those two nights, I wasn't able to sleep, and every time I closed my eyes I had a dream that I was being assaulted. I told my dad, and he decided that we should try and sleep in our own house. On our third night there, we were walking down the street late at night to visit my grandparents and my uncle Jay was there. He was drinking and said that the doll was going to get us if we kept walking at night. He was drunk, so I dismissed the comment. Later that night, we came home and tried to sleep for the first time. I'm not going to lie, the house feels really creepy at night. I can't walk down a long hallway that goes to an empty room because I feel some bad energy there. My room faces the big glass sliding door we have to the backyard. I always felt like someone was watching me there. We've been here for three weeks already, and yesterday my little cousin Jack was outside with us in the backyard. We were burning trash and he mentioned that the doll lived in the big tree in our backyard. He lives right next to us, and we don't have a gate separating our property from his. He says he can hear it cry at night, and one time he saw it when he was going to the restroom, as their restroom is located outside their house towards the backyard. I didn't believe him, but got spooked out, and that same night, Uncle D's son was playing Xbox with us. Cousin Jack was with us too, and my brother brought up that doll and said that Cousin Jack was lying to us. As soon as we mentioned it, Uncle D's son went pale and said he didn't want to talk about it. That spooked me out, because Uncle D said that the doll was haunting them. So, if it was true, his son had to know something about it. It scared him so much, 
and that's when I believed it. He got me thinking, and that's probably why at night I felt like something watches me. My room faces the glass door, and the tree is right in front of it. So, after a few days, we noticed our sink was smelling. Now we were on vacation, so we weren't cooking, and everything in the sink was mainly cups or bowls of cereal. We went on a three-day trip to Guatemala, as we were staying in Chiapas, so the dishes from that morning were left uncleaned for three days. When we came back, there was a rank smell coming from the sink. It smelled like rotten flesh, and we didn't know where it was coming from. I then cleaned the dishes, and hundreds of larvae started to crawl out the sink. Some people might think that it was us being dirty, but we never found what caused that reek. I didn't find any rotten meat or anything that the larvae were eating. Some people said it must have been the pipes or something in the walls. But the house is brand new, and the walls are made of brick and cement. As soon as the larvae came out, the smell went away. It was like a scene from a horror movie. We all left when we heard my cousin describing the muñeca differently. Someone said it was a mono or a monkey, so we concluded that it could have been a shapeshifter. I luckily never ran into it, but there have always been stories going around of unexplained things happening there. People say that they could have been made up stories because people are bored, whereas others say it's the truth. I've had my own experiences in there before. I've heard something with dark, heavy voice speaking to me in English, when no one there speaks it. I've had dolls that I brought from the United States start moving when I leave them in that house. My brother claimed that he heard La Llorona before when he was coming home late. It could just be our imagination, but stuff does happen in Mexico. I was 13, and I was sleeping at my friend's house down the block. It was nighttime, and my friend's brother went to an abandoned psychiatric center, Pilgrim State, and told us about some stuff that supposedly happened to him and his friends. He told us they couldn't leave the way they entered for whatever reason, so him and his friends ran to the other side of the building, and as they passed each room, the lights inside would turn on. Crazy. Probably lies, but some crazy stuff happened later. We were playing video games there, and this light next to my friend's futon was flickering. It was around 10pm, and one of us said something to the effect of, Stop doing that, to the light as a joke. But the light did stop flickering. It stayed on, and it hadn't since we switched it on. Then we told it to start flickering again, which it did. This is nothing crazy, but it definitely caught our attention. But eventually we started asking it to turn on and off at specific patterns, which it started to do. Stay off for five seconds, blink three times, stay on for five seconds, blink seven times, stay off for eight seconds, stuff like that. We would usually begin and end the patterns with staying on or off for a certain amount of time. And then it would go back to basically being on and flickering. But then we would stay to pattern, and it would stop flickering and then either stay on or off for however many seconds we said, and then light up and turn off, in even steady intervals to show our patterns, then go back to flickering. It wasn't natural. It was like someone was turning it on and off with the switch. But it wasn't connected to a switch on the wall. It was like a novelty beer glass with a light in it. Not a regular lamp like the one you're picturing. Its on and off switch was one of those wheel things with the long cable on the plug. There's no way to turn it on or off remotely, and it did these patterns perfectly. Me and my friend continue to tell this light to perform patterns by lighting up and turning off. We did this for hours. I can't emphasize enough that it did not mess up once, and it was never just close enough. If we told it to stay on, it would stop flickering and stay on, and work properly until we told it to do something else. It would stay on or off for any amount of time we asked, even minutes at a time. Like we would tell it to turn off and come back on for a certain amount of time and vice versa. 
It was just impossible to be that accurate by chance. It was perfect in every way. And as these patterns got more complicated, the longer we continued to do it, it did everything as we asked. But one thing I remember is me telling it to blink 300 times. And then it started rapid fire blinking super fast, way faster than it had the whole night prior. And as I was watching it blink at super speed, I said stop. And the millisecond the word came out my mouth. It didn't blink anymore. We had to make sure that his brother hadn't found a way to mess with us through the light. But we couldn't figure out how. The same outlet that the light was plugged into had an alarm clock plugged in as well, which was acting totally normal. So we knew that he wasn't messing with the circuit breaker or anything like that, because you can't control that one single plug in an outlet from his circuit breaker. His neighbor was also a cop. So we wondered if maybe his son had found some sort of equipment that we didn't know about, and was somehow using it to control the light remotely. While listening to us, even though the TV and AC were on, and we were speaking pretty softly. So it would have been hard to hear us clearly through the extra noise if someone were using some sort of device. But we were just basically running through everything. We had plenty of time to think over this. So in order to rule this stuff out, we decided to ask the light questions. Questions it could answer via lighting up and turning off and questions we knew his brother or neighbor or anybody didn't really know the answers to. I have a huge family. So I had distant members his family didn't know, and a lot of questions to ask. This was essentially, I'm thinking of a number, and it would steadily light up and turn off the number of times in my head, then go back to flickering. I asked it questions I knew no one in his family or neighbors knew. And my friend asked questions about people I'd never heard of, and I'm sure my family hadn't. In case someone from my house was outside my friend's house to mess with us, and answering these questions. An example would be when I asked, Stay off for 10 seconds, then tell me how many kids my aunt Joan has, and then stay off for 20 seconds. And it would go from being on, flickering and then turn off for 10 seconds. Then if my aunt Joan has six kids, it would turn on and off six times. Then it would stay off for 20 seconds, like I said. We asked it so many questions, and every time we asked, it got it right. They didn't know any of my cousins or anything like that, so realistically, no one would have been able to do this. We were purposely being very quiet and had the TV on pretty loud and the AC was on. The only person it could have been was my friend next to me, but we were holding hands the whole night. Eventually, we saw no other way. There must have been something in that room with us that we were openly communicating with. We never held a seance or anything like that. It just showed up. I mean, it knew things like the names of my uncle that died as an infant and other random impossible stuff. We were getting scared though. I remember we were holding hands super tightly, but once we decided it had to be some crazy stuff, we asked it questions about itself. Again, questions it could answer numerically in yes or no. We asked if it was human, and if it had died. It was a he. He was black. He was age 13 when he died, and he had been a patient at Pilgrim State Psychiatric Center near my town before it had shut down. The one my friend's brother went to. But who knows if it's true? If it can communicate, it can lie. Maybe it was an alien. Seemed like it could read minds or it had just knowledge of our families. It said God and the devil are real. I don't remember everything we asked it, just random things like asking if it was the same ghost that visited any of my siblings, could they had some weird stories, and it said no. We asked if it knew who haunted them, and it said yes. We asked if it could come back, and it said no. We asked if it wanted to hurt us, and it said yes. It also said it was going to kill us when we asked it. And when we asked if it was going to kill us that night, it said yes. It, however, didn't. We were definitely scared, but after a while, it still hadn't done anything. Me and my friend were holding hands, and our other hands on top of our heads. So it was like we were holding four hands in a big bundle. 
Towards the end of it, nothing had happened. So we began inquiring as to how it was going to end us. Like were there syringes or something deadly in our shoes or was it going to poison our milk? Eventually around 6am, I remember just going up and unplugging the light. We didn't want to before that. I'm not sure why. Maybe because it was the craziest thing ever and we weren't sure if unplugging it would make it stop. But it was also threatening to kill us so we had to. It was early in the morning by that time. Nothing happened after it was unplugged. We had breakfast with his father who didn't believe us and that was that. No one thought we'd seen anything and life went on. This story takes place in the year 1993. I was a sophomore in high school. I must emphasize the importance of the year as cell phones, internet, and effortless forms of mass communication at your fingertips were non-existent. There is ample amount of backstory. At this time in my life, my friends and I were very carelessly using a Ouija board that I found in my deceased great uncle's attic after he passed. Again, I won't go into details here, other than it was a wooden board, old, and had no instructions. We took it home, and my sisters and I, along with my friend, began to play with it. Weeks went by, a few months went by, and lots of weird stuff was happening in the house with my friends. I am a strong believer in the paranormal, and didn't question much of what was happening, as it was witnessed not by just me, but many others. I saw such occurrences change the belief of staunch skeptics in a matter of moments. I was terrified most of the time, sleeping with my lights on, and never alone. At times, I was even amused by it. Then came a day in early spring of 1993, that my friends and I were sitting at around a table in the library of our high school. The topic always seemed to circle back around to what was happening at my house. There were four of us sitting at the table, myself, Monica, Kim and Suzanne. I was beginning to get a little agitated and began to feel arrogant. So arrogant that I said aloud to my friends almost these exact words. If you're so powerful and so real, then you wouldn't be stuck at my house. So show us a sign you can hear us from beyond the board. And just like that, all the lights off in the entire library went out for an entire five seconds. When they came back, I continued my overconfident banter by laughing and saying, really, that's all you have. The bell rang shortly after, and it was time to go home. I didn't think too much of the incident after, but I knew my fake egotistical act may have some consequences down the line. That night when I fell asleep, I had a dream. This was one of those dreams or visions, if you may, that you wake from and feel it. You can recite every line and detail of it. To this day, I can still feel the resonation and remember it. The dream starts off in the morning as I began to walk to school from the street. I am then plagued with a sense of terror and a sense that I was slowly being chased. There was a procession of black hooded figures, fully cloaked, with no signs of human life underneath, just a human form. There were six of them, all with their heads down. It was broad daylight, and they were each carrying a torch. In the middle of them was a very tall figure, again all in black, with a red stripe down the front of his cloak. He was not carrying a torch, but rather a long pewter staff. This is when I stopped studying the details of who this was. I knew who it was, and I knew they were after me, especially him. They were not running or in any type of haste. The procession was slow and methodical. I ran in the school fast and frantically began to look for a spot to hide in the library, as that was where my dreams put me. I jumped over these bookshelves, which were low to the ground, both in the dream world and real world, and balled up on a shelf, hiding and praying not to be found. That's when I awoke, breathless. I said a few words as I got ready for school and on the bus that morning. None of my friends involved in the library situation or the Ouija stuff in general were on the same bus route, 
and I dared not speak a word of it to the kids I rode the bus with, as most of them I despised. When I arrived at school, finding my friends Monica and Kim waiting for me at the north entrance, as they did every morning, and I began to detail my dream to them. We had entered the main hallway as I finished recounting the dream, when running from the south entrance, which was a pretty good distance from us, was Suzanne. I do not feel I need to drive home the point, that there were no cell phones and no conceivable ways of Suzanne getting any of this information. This is exactly as it happened and is 100% accurate. Trying as hard as she could to catch her breath, she looked at me and said, I have a message for you. Him. Tell Nicole she can run, but she can't hide. To this day, every time I tell this story, I envision him laughing still and saying, I found. So about six months after I bought our house, I started noticing something odd. Every once in a while, I would catch sight of something out of the corner of my eye, and always assume it was my cat, since it was the same size and shape, and moved like a cat. However, I would realize a few seconds later, that my cat was in the yard or another room. It would try to look back, but nothing was ever there. It was so quick I always dismissed it. Once at night, I saw it on the ceiling, and I about had a heart attack. I would also hear things in the house. I assumed my husband was doing the dishes due to the clinking in the sink, but then I would realize he was in the bedroom, and the kitchen was empty. It took about a year for my husband and I to start wondering aloud if we were actually seeing things, or if something dubious was up. Turns out he was seeing stuff too. Just little flashes here and there. My husband said he heard some stuff too on his days off, when no one was home. The biggest moment was when I woke up in the middle of the night, and saw my cat curled up on my side table. I heard him purr. His fur looked darker, and his purr was lower, but I was half asleep and didn't notice. I went to the bathroom, and on my way I passed my sleeping cat in the hallway. It actually took me a few seconds, but I literally felt my chest turn cold. I went back into my bedroom, and saw that the bedside table was empty. We're pretty sure we have a ghost cat in our house. The only thing I know about the previous owners, was that he was put into a mental hospital. I've had to routine a bunch of paperwork back over to him over the years, because his affairs were very clearly not taken care of when he was hospitalized. My theory is that he had a cat that got lost in the shuffle, and it's still waiting for him to come home. I work for a non-profit that helps mentally and physically disabled people live fulfilling lives. John and Chris are brothers. I work for the same company as Chris, but at a different house. There are several houses around the city and bordering area. He works at one that houses children. Only children. Four of them, I believe. His story begins on a graveyard shift, which he was working with one co-worker, a middle-aged woman. The house has alarms on the doors and windows, which are alarmed during the night to let them know if any kids are trying to leave when they shouldn't be. Chris was downstairs in the office. His co-worker was upstairs cleaning. Suddenly, all the alarms in the house went off, every door and window. He sprang up, assuming the clients were planning a mass breakout, as he would later refer to it. He yelled to his co-worker to head out one door, and he went out the other frantically looking for whoever was outside. He saw one client standing beneath a tree, but not apparently in a hurry. He thought he recognized the client to be someone called Barry. Barry, head back inside, he said, or something to that effect. He continued searching for the other clients, but after running around in a panic, found no one. He gave up and headed inside to reconvene with his co-worker. 
He said he found Barry, but no one else. She stunned him when she revealed that everyone was inside having never left, including Barry. He said she must be mistaken. He was outside a big tree in the backyard. She wore her fear on her face when he insisted this. She explained how what he saw was in fact what staff of the house refer to as white dress, a ghostly woman wearing all white that seems to reside on the property and is often seen under that tree. Needless to say, he was surprised and confused and definitely creeped out. But the story doesn't end there. Sometime later, a client from another home, whom Chris was very close to sadly died. He was sick for a while, and Chris was present for his final breaths in the hospital. He was wheelchair bound when he was alive, and later a client at the white dress home needed a wheelchair temporarily while recovering from a slip and fall accident. They brought the wheelchair that used to belong to Kieran. And right away, Barry began fixating on it. When it was no longer in use, Barry would take it for his own enjoyment. Staff took note of this and couldn't explain why he loved it so much. He would take it outside to a small hill, push it down the hill empty and then return it to the top and do it over and over again. Barry is nonverbal and that he can't speak with spoken language, but he does understand speech and communicates using gestures. One useful gesture has him select staff's left or right hand in a sort of this or that conversation. For example, he could hold out my hand and say, Barry, do you want tacos for dinner tonight? And identify it as left hand option. Or do you want burgers for dinner tonight? Right hand and then he would choose. He also had a tick where he would hold his palm up to his face very close and sort of mumble into it. This is actually what Chris thought he saw when white dress was under the tree. He thought Barry was there doing that. This is important because Barry would often do this gesture when he played with the wheelchair. Staff got curious and thought they might be able to determine who Barry was speaking to and playing within the wheelchair. They posed a sequence of this and that questions with fake names. Barry, who's in the wheelchair? Is it Michael or Emily? No response. Is it James or Samuel? No response. Is it Stephanie or Teresa? No response. They did this a few times before dropping in the real name casually. Is it Kieran or Jen? Right away, he selected the correct hand. Everyone present was shocked. According to Chris, he was the only real link between Kieran and this house. Barry and Kieran didn't know each other, and he didn't believe anyone talked of the previous owner of the wheelchair. And he can't explain how Barry knew his name. This story doesn't end there, however. For reasons unknown to me, Chris took this wheelchair home for a while. Maybe it was a keepsake. He took it home with him, and weird things began happening around his house. Chris and John, like I said, are brothers. They live in a big house and rent it out with their girlfriends, as well as two others. One day, everyone was out, except for John and Chris's girlfriend. Both of them claimed the door to Chris's bedroom slammed much too loudly and hard to be explained by wind, especially since no windows in his bedroom were open. This happened a few times while the wheelchair was there, which is more interesting when you know that Kieran would often get Chris's attention by slamming doors. John said other strange things had happened once the wheelchair arrived too, but I'm a bit confounded on details. I do know he claimed to have once heard someone calling his name, but no one was home but him. As I said, both Chris and John remain skeptics. They agree these events are all strange, but ultimately are not convinced. I too am what I call a hopeful skeptic. I would love for any of the paranormal subjects in the world to be verified, but I guess I need to see it myself to believe it. John summarized his feelings well by saying, I'm not saying it was a ghost. I'm just saying weird things would happen while we had the wheelchair here. And they stopped when the wheelchair left. 
I asked about the current whereabouts of this wheelchair, but I forget what they said. Either they don't know, or it's somewhere else in the company, where Chris no longer visits. If I can get hold of it, I'd love to ask for more details. I'd like to know what you guys think about these stories. Specifically, I'm curious to know more about what John said are referred to as anchor points. The wheelchair was present when Kieran died. Apparently, some believe that souls, which I do not believe in, can attach themselves to physical objects of importance from a person's life. This logic doesn't make sense to me. Even if I suspend my disbelief and believe in ghosts, what makes me believe these ghosts can attach themselves to objects? Is it the same logic that ghosts haunt certain areas, homes, vehicles or rooms? I'm just dying to be convinced. And I always love hearing more stories and reading theories and learning about this topic. Finally, I'd like to mention that I spoke to John. He also has videos of the chair moving by itself on flat ground. It was deleted on his phone, but he hopes a co-worker still has it. He also clarified that he never really attributed these events to the chair until later when he heard staff speculate there was a cursed object and he put it all together. Lastly, he added that another boy at the house was able to describe white dress and he often played with the wheelchair too. The details get kind of confusing because the white dress stories and the wheelchair stories are separate, but he said it was all amplified once the chair arrived at the house. Finally, he told me of an incident where the wheelchair was rolling down hills and slamming the doors and it was strange to him, because those were the things that Kieran loved to do the most while he was alive. My father's dad was a dog trainer. He had a huge room where he would train golden retrievers. One day he sent my father a golden overseas, as he lived across the country. When he got him, he was overjoyed. He was a beautiful boy and would prance around and love to play in the water. One thing he'd do was chew the legs of tables and other furniture, so my dad called him Chewy. Many people assumed he was named after Chewbacca, but this simply wasn't the case. When my parents adopted me, this dog was my companion. In pictures, I can see how protective he actually was. He was a really great dog in general. He loved the snow and he was family. That's when we got the devastating news that he had heart disease and would last no more than a few years. Those years were golden. We did everything for his needs and then he was gone. Now this experience happened last night and I will never forget it. Right now I'm 17 and was adopted at the age of two. It was probably midnight. I put my dog into my room and I walk out into the hall. And when I turned, I could see an outline of Chewy. I could see his big black eyes and his fur was as golden as could be. He was smiling as any golden retriever would do. And I felt an overwhelming sense of joy and happiness. And I just smiled before walking into my room. Now, before this even happened, I always had a feeling he was laying in my room, even though my dog of right now, Baxter, was as well. When I first got my new dog, he would always look into the corner where Chewy used to lay. And from then on, I knew that Chewy would always be with me. My friend and I had a long day filled to the brim with fun and adventure, joyous and whimsical things. After we had spent most of the day in the downtown portion of Charleston, enjoying the cool breeze, watching the rough waters roll against the docks, we decided it would be best to head back before nightfall. Some time had passed and we eventually arrived back in our city of Somerville, but our appetite for the fun and excitement hadn't been sated yet. So we decided to drive around and look at a newer town that had been added close to us. 
the town of Summer's Corner. It was a nice town, sure enough, but it felt off, unreal. It was heavy and almost suffocating, the feeling that was there, that wouldn't deter us, as we were quite the resilient bunch, always moving forwards, keeping a smile on our face, even if the circumstances are pure, unadulterated agony. About a half hour into the drive, we discovered a street called Navajo Boulevard, which had immediately interested us, as the name itself is similar to the Native American tribe of the Navajo people, just with a slight spelling differential. These Native Americans live in the southern United States, and are a great proud people. They have many traditions with their tribes, with one such telling of a frightful creature. This creature is pure evil, a true monster among men. It is known as the Yenaldushi, and is a shape-shifting vile, heart-wrenched fiend. We started to drive down the road, our windows rolled down so that we could enjoy that cool southern breeze. It's a dark, starry night, and while beautiful above us, the feeling from earlier was thicker and almost encumbering. Immediately I felt watched, not by the nightlife, which we noticed was eerily silent, but by something else. Whatever was watching us didn't want us there at all. It felt as though whatever it was, was close to us. Its presence was intimidating and quite malicious, not to mention that it put us on edge. Our eyes peeled, and ourselves readied for whatever may happen next. What seemed like an hour or so had passed, when suddenly, where there had been no wind before, a heavy gust slammed itself against the car, nearly pushing it off the road and into the woods. Our hearts were about to beat out of our chests from the shock of it all, or at least mine was. Just then, as I tried to keep us on the road, we saw something pass by the car. It was grotesque, Motted with malice and spiteful things. Its eyes, as pale as silver as the moon, gazed into our souls, sending nothing but fear throughout our bodies. We were motionless now, shrinking into our seats as this abomination grew closer. It unhinged its jaw and let out a horrific scream, snapping us back to reality. I put the car in gear, and we drove the hell out of there. Unfortunately, the feeling was intensified as we got back onto the road and sped away, another gust of wind slamming into the car. Suddenly, my friend had yelled for me to look out the window. Right behind my seatbelt on the outside of the car was that monster, and that's when I saw this awful thing in its entirety. It had reddish pale skin and eyes that seemed to have no end, with goat and reptilian slits for pupils. The horns from atop its forehead gave it a demonic appearance, our fear intensifying beyond belief as a result. It unhinged its maw and revealed a row of sharp and twisted teeth, a hand with long claws stretched at the glass, making us scream to high heaven. As we were driving out of the neighborhood, going as fast as we could, the damned thing smiled at us and faded away. The breeze scattered the leaves on the road where it sauntered after it had jumped from my car. It was gone, but the feeling of fear that it left us with would haunt us for months to come. This happened today. I was cooking with my sister. She was boiling the pasta and eggs, and I was making chef salad meaning I was cutting the lettuce, tomatoes, cucumbers, and the cheeses and salami. I asked her to cut one of the cheeses when this happened. I was cutting the salami while my sister was cutting the rigotto cheese, when I felt a warm hand, the palm of a hand to be exact, slowly pushing me forwards towards the table. The palm was at the left side, and the place underneath your shoulder, with the same level as your armpit. That hand slowly removed its palm from me, and the place was numb. 
It was a tingling and warm sensation, but my entire body froze instantly. My sister and I didn't see anyone or anything, but she saw me how one minute I was joking and how the roles inside our household were reversed and the kids did most of the chores while the adults were playing on their phones or sleeping. When I gasped and my body moved forward. Now the first couple of seconds, my brain thought it was our dad trying not to scare me by touching me, because behind me is the terrace door that leads to a room that was supposed to be the balcony, but my grandparents closed it and turned it into the sunroom that leads to another set of terrace doors that leads to the master bedroom. But the fact that our dad could be heard snoring, and I felt the hand, scared me. My sister didn't freak out as much, but she got scared seeing me become white like snow from fear. When I explained to her what I felt, she told me some days she feels the same thing, especially at night. A warm hand on her back before she falls asleep. She told me she thought it was only her mind playing tricks on her. Then I told her that many times I have felt shoves or someone touching me as I do chores around the house. One time I was dancing and I felt a hand on my shoulder and turned to see if mum or dad or an aunt or my sister were in the house and were trying to get my attention, but I saw nothing. One time, I felt it in my hair like a stroke after I woke up from a nightmare. Two days ago, I was bolted awake. My entire body jerked forward because of the nightmare. I can't recall what happened in it. I just knew I was in danger when I felt the hand stroking my hair. And when I turned, I saw nothing but the Christmas tree I thought I had unplugged. When I looked at my phone, it said 9.45 AM. So I went to take my 10 AM pill and fall back asleep. It's not the first time, but it was the first time it happened while I was with someone else in the room. I don't know if it's a friendly ghost, one of my grandparents, or any other loved one that I've lost, as we've had many through the past decades. My best friend said that it might be muscle spasms, but why do they feel like a warm hand? My sister also complained a few months ago that she feels watched in her room at night, and that is why she sleeps with the music on and covers over her head. And I told her that it must be grandma, since the room my sister is in was my grandma's favorite room. She used to pray and listen to the church on the radio when she couldn't attend. The house was built in 1978, and my grandparents sort of ordered it to be the way it is. And in 1938, my grandparents were the first residents. My house along with the rest of the apartments in the building were also built in 1978. The area before it was built in was a river and farms, according to my mother's knowledge. Could it be a ghost or something else?